Uh, very good evening to one and all of you. A very warm, warm welcome to our ARC webinar yet again on video bouquet of uh, cataract surgeries. And I promise you the next two and a half hours with these lovely videos is going to be packed with learning and our expert panel is are going to majorly contribute to enhance our learning process. And there is some nostalgia associated this webinar because this is going to be the last webinar of this term, you know, and uh, I need to especially, uh, besides thanking each and every one of you who are there in this memorable webinar, I need to thank three of those dear friends who are here, others here to join, Harshul Srinivas and Satyajit Sina, who actually, I don't know how imperceptibly they just creeped in to my, my mental process and they are like an essential part of my family now you know the amount of affection is it a sisterly affection a motherly affection i don't know i really have come there for them and they've been such solid support systems for me to ensure that this webinar this arc of the last three years uh, stayed uh, alive energetic and uh, good for you I take this opportunity to uh, invite our expert panel, uh, Dr. Aru Burmik, who actually needs no introduction, who's a senior consultant in cataract, cornea, and refractive services from the Disha Group of Eye Hospitals and is a, a prolific, versatile surgeon. We have with us Dr. Satyamurthy, a smiling, gentle person who heads the cornea and refractive surgery of M.M. Joshi Group of Eye Institute. I somehow uh, missed him in our webinars, and uh, I'm so glad that he's with us yet again in a very memorable webinar. Thank we you. have uh, joining us soon to be uh, Dr. Gopal Raju, who is again uh, who heads the, is the chairman of the Vishaka Eye Hospital, uh, Vishaka Patna, and is a senior consultant in cataract, cornea, and anterior segment. We have with us Dr. Rishi Swaroop, who has been a very popular figure of our ARC webinars always with a smile and always with wonderful tips and learning, who again uh, leads the Swaroop Eye Center at Hyderabad and again, um, man of all seasons. We have with us Dr. Nitin Dedia. I'm truly enlightened to have you with us. He's again, uh, heads the OHS Eye Hospital Mumbai and an extremely dynamic surgeon and very innovative in his skill sets. And I'm sure we are going to learn a lot more from him. Joining us soon would be Dr. Ellen Kumaran, who's again, Medical Director of Navashakti Netralia and also a Senior Cataract and Cornea Refractive Surgeon. Moderating with me is Dr. Harshul Tak, who is the uh, Chief Surgeon uh, from Rawat Eye and Faco Surgery, uh, Rajasthan, and uh, is a member ARC uh, Central Zone and uh, has been the Chairman Scientific Committee of the Rajasthan State Ophthalmic Society. And we all know how famous he has made life beyond ophthalmology with his uh, very innovative style and imagination. And of course, I'm also very lucky to have with me two more moderators, Dr. Satyajit Sinha, uh, member ARC East, again, who's the chairman of the ABI hospital uh, based at uh, Patna, uh, uh, very, very friendly national figure, and Srinivas Joshi, who is one of the directors of the MM Joshi Group of Hospital who's member ARC South, who again is an unbelievably capable surgeon. And with such stalwarts with me, I'm sure this is going to be a webinar to remember. We go on to our first speaker, Dr. Ajay Mehta, who is a director of the Kesubai Mehta Eye Hospital Rajkot. And let us see what he has to show. On to you, Dr. Ajay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So before I begin, uh, I would like to thank the IOS ARC office bearers, Dr. Chitra and Dr. Harsul for making me part of this prestigious forum. Uh, as you all know, cataract surgery volumes have grown in leaps and bounds. And so uh, now the complications have also started rising. And now we in our routine practices are facing intraocular lenses that have subluxated, moved around and so today I'll talk about how to fix them in the proper place without removing them outside the eye. So this is a single and a double flange technique. So here is a patient with a 3B sial and a posterior capsular rent. The lens has already moved away. So now I'm interfering and uh, taking the lens into the anterior chamber. 
both the loops are now in the anterior chamber and then I do uh, pass plana vitrectomy, the limited anterior vitrectomy to remove the, whatever remnants are there. Now uh, we have learned uh, in the Yamana technique, uh, the procedure, how to do it. And the similar procedure is done here, but the difference is the lens is already inside the anterior chamber. So we can remove uh, by railroad technique, one of the loops and, uh, and then this uh, loop should be held gently with the help of uh, micro forceps so that it does not slip back into the anterior chamber or uh, behind the iris. Now I'm using here a ballpoint cautery, which is available in uh, any operation theater uh, around the country. So with this, a nice flange is formed and a similar flange is then made on the other side. And then the lens is rotated. And with this, the loop will uh, slowly go into the scleral tunnel. And this is how the lens becomes very centered at the end of the surgery. And this is the post-operative picture. And not only that, we can see the flanges lying in the conjunctiva uh, in the scleral tunnels. So this is with the three PCRs. What if we have a subluxated single PCR? Well, for that, we have the double flange technique now. So this is a three-piece hydrophilic lens. The patient has already developed a thick PCO and the lens is so mobile that when the patient goes to sleep, he has good vision. When he gets up, the vision goes down. So I have taken him up for management and here what I need extra is a 6-0 vicryl and a 30 gauge needle. So I enter the anterior chamber and uh, with the 2.2 millimeter keratome and then with the help of a McPherson forceps, I just remove one of the haptics outside the anterior chamber. And then the 30 gate needle is used to thread the haptic, the outer haptic, and then the 60 proline is railroaded inside in this manner. Once that is done, the you can form the flange on the top or you can form on the bottom or whatever is the surgeon's choice so here i have made it on the top the flange with the help of a battery operated cautery which i'll just show now i now rotate the lens inside and take out the other haptic and in a similar fashion i then do a railroading and here i would like to show you how actually i am trying to make a flange. This is uh, a very easy technique and just the heat of the pottery is enough to create a very large bulb. And that is it. I mean, it just takes a few seconds. Uh, once that is done, both the loops are rotated inside the eye. Now remember in Yamanan technique, uh, because the loops are very small, uh, it is very difficult to manage everything. But here, after introducing this 30 gauge needle, I can just uh, remove the large length of uh, the suture material outside the eye. And uh, this is done even on the other side. And once I have uh, both the loops outside, I would, uh, before, uh, making a pottery and uh, making bulbs, I would like to clear the posterior capsule opacification and the summerings ring so that the lens can remain stable for the rest of his life. So now I'm uh, doing the pottery and making a large bulb uh, with almost a four to five millimeters melt of the six zero proline. And with this, we get a beautiful bulb, which can then be gently either dyed or pushed below the conjunctiva into the intrascleral tissues. And this is the final post-op picture. The patient has a very stable and a well-centered single PCIL now. And uh, these uh, 
are the bulbs resting below the conjecture. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Dr. Ajay, uh, Ajay, for your very <coughs> innovative way of uh, doing uh, this surgery. Uh, I would want a question uh, with the expert panel. Hello, uh, uh, very good evening, Dr. Gopal Raji. You were not there when I was introducing. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for the late joining. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, any uh, of the expert panel uh, could uh, take this. Um, now, I, I, he must have done it, but I did not notice uh, whether he made an angled approach uh, when he uh, buried the uh, that bulbous end of the haptic. Uh, could you explain how it could be done or should yeah. it be done? No, no, it, it, it has always uh, to be an angled approach. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to go two millimeters away from the limbus and then an angle of two millimeters to the upper or the lower side depending on where we are uh, sitting. So then only uh, will the bulb rest in the scleral tunnel. So I mean, that, that is what I did not mention because uh, it is already there in the Yamane technique. Uh, yeah. What I wanted to show was this double flange technique for single piece aisles, which were still, which are still not popular. Now, what but, about the suture degradation, which could happen uh, in these? Uh, yes, so, so the uh, this technique was uh, popularized by Dr. Kana Brava, and he has now uh, seven years of follow up, and uh, he has uh, written in his articles, in his uh, research papers in the JSCRS, that till date none of his lenses have dislocated or moved from that. How do you ensure that the IOL is uh, well centered if it is? Uh... Yes, Madam, we, we have to visually, visually titrate and uh, pull because the there is another study by Dr. Kanabrava where he has shown that the bulbs and the 60 proline will never break. The haptics can break, but this will not break. So they are very tight. So you can just uh, titrate and center the lens. How do you maintain? Steril, uh, sorry, sorry to button. How do you maintain sterility of the uh, the cautery handle cautery? Are you putting it inside a glove and using it, or uh, no? We you put just, it in a family chamber. No, or, no, no, no. Uh, this uh, we wrap it. Uh, the tips are in the formalin chamber, and uh, the entire uh, handpiece, the battery, and all. We need to cover it in a plastic uh, wrap. And uh, it works really well. And in fact, uh, now surgeons are doing trifocal lenses and even toric lenses with this technique because this technique makes the lenses very stable. Yes, uh, Dr. Ameya, we wanted to ask something. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, sir, whether he's had any uh, cases of exposure of the bulb or the phalange or any endocellumitis. It has been reported in JCRS and uh, the last ESCRS also, there was a lot of discussion on the Canabrava technique causing endocellumitis. What is your uh, experience regarding this, sir? No, it, that can happen if you use a very thick needle or if the bulbs are very large. But mm -hmm. if there is a controlled bulb formation and if you are... Uh, careful enough to gently push it in, in the um, scleral space, intrascleral space. Uh, it just does not happen. In fact, uh, these are the eyes that are so quiet that uh, in few days, the patient will also forget that he had a complication in the past. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, do you have anything to add because you do quite a few of the different procedures? Sir, uh, uh, good, good surgery, Mehta, sir. In case the bulb doesn't come that well in case you have that flattening of that tip. So how do you manage these cases, sir? Because uh, the bovi heat cautery or any heat cautery sometimes might be very trickier and getting a good bulb also might not happen all the time. The repeatability of that might not happen all the time. So in these cases, uh, what would be your advice? Because that will get exposed and do you want it to flatten it and then paste it over the sclera and then cover the conjunctiva? How, how would you like us to manage? Yes, uh, the first thing is uh, you need to make that uh, two millimeter scleral tunnel. 
that is the very uh, necessary thing the second thing is whatever uh, uh, 60 weekly or 50 weekly use uh, have hold it at the base and then 3 mm away you start applying the battery operated cautery so the, uh, the 60 proline will start melting and will almost touch the forceps and that is the end point and let me tell you it is the uniform process for each and every case and uh, it's like playing a video game and you will soon start enjoying this cases because they give the same result in all of them so i agree with your point sir so for the people who doesn't have the heat cautery so in these cases we do advise use the ball point cautery yes 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 so when we do the ball point cautery what i usually advise is to make a flap and then externalize these haptics whether it can be a haptic in the yamane or the sajio kanabrava technique where you try to pull out the 60 proline so the flaps try to cover it so if the flaps cover it then there will be as amaya said there will be very less chances of endophthalmitis nor there will be any chances of conjunctival extrusion also yes so one or two additional steps uh, need to be incorporated that's just what... one thing to highlight don't flatten the bulb it is keep it as a bulb and put it in the scleral tunnel if you flatten the bulb then it is very difficult to put into the scleral tunnel exactly. if you make it a bulb then it is easily uh, introduced into you can put it into the scleral tunnel then you can uh, really really prevent a further complication but if once it is flattened it is better to have a scleral tunnel so that uh, it that uh, the flat end it under cover of the scleral flap uh, uh, but Thanks. wonderful surgery dr rajay i i also did two or three cases uh, like single piece canavera technique but that technique is very nice but uh, really you have to have a good heat cautery otherwise uh, ball point cautery sometimes not you have to repeatedly you have to hit that cautery and and it's very difficult to get uh, that red um, red wire but red coil should be there to get a good bulb exactly and the bulb yes. will also not happen with a ball point yeah exactly more with the heat for the yeah, yes sir only thing is if you are doing a scleral tunnel and you have to uh, do a conjunctival peritomy it really defeats the advantage yeah, of yes. yeah money you know which is quick and fairly bloodless no uh, one suggestion sir Yes. Uh, can we say with the twenty-five uh, this thing, uh, trocar and cannula, just externalize the haptics and then uh, cauterize the uh, so like uh, the same process, cauterize the haptic? Will it not serve the purpose? The same thing as glued IOL, but you are not tucking anything. You just no. You are going to create a flange, no? Flange, and yeah. it will go under the conjunctiva, and then probably it will not go under the flap also. Yes. Okay. Then, so, uh, 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 but how how will you do for um, single piece IOL because? No, you need a good piece. bulb. Uh, this uh, for three piece, yes, it is fine. But th there is a case shown in the yeah, ECR that they, they externalize that through the uh, trocar cannula, and then remove the trocar, and they make a tunnel, just like a glue dial, make it a gravel shaded tunnel. They make a tunnel and then tuck it into the, this. Then you can do this, and I think uh, many of the retinal surgeon doing this uh, through the. uh that uh, trocar many of the surgeon is doing this that technique that uh... agree agree anup yeah, yeah. Okay, we shall go on to our next presentation because it's taken quite a long time we thanks a lot dr ajay we have next is dr ajit hazari uh, who's again uh, 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 heads the hazari eye center aurangabad and is a very proficient cataract uh, glaucoma and refractive surgeon and he is going to show us his video on to you dr ajay thank ajay. you ma'am i feel honored to be part of this uh, group and i'll be sharing a small video on uh, uh, a pc rent without vitreous loss and at a totally unexpected time standard uneventful fico emulsification stop and chop for grade 3 nuclear sclerosis While emulsifying of the last few nuclear pieces, a defect in the epinuclear plate was noticed. Immediately slowing down the speed of emulsification, the OT staff was asked to ready the anterior vitrectomy probe. In order to prevent the collapse of the AC, 
dispersive viscoelastic was injected before withdrawing the handpiece. Careful cortex aspiration was done, starting from the area opposite the PC rent. Cortex was aspirated in a centripetal direction, all the while keeping a watch on the PC rent. Due to the low IOP used of between 26 to 30 mm, the anterior chamber was stable with minimal turbulence and depth fluctuation. Before interchanging the hands during cortex aspiration, dispersive viscoelastic was again injected to prevent anterior chamber collapse. On complete removal of cortex, the PC rent was seen to stretch from 1 to 4 o'clock position, thus precluding the possibility of an in-the-bag IOL placement. We decided to implant a three-piece foldable IOL in the sulcus with optic capture behind the anterior capsular edge. The bag was filled adequately to give enough space for the stiff haptics of the IOL to unfold. Aspiration of the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber confirmed the stable fixation of the IOL as well as the intact anterior hyaloid face with no vitreous loss. In summary we'd like to suggest some tips in a situation of unexpected events during routine cataract surgery. 1. Slow down. Cool down. 2. Prevent AC collapse. 3. Reduce IOP. 4. Reduce turbulence. 5. Be ready for anterior vitrectomy. 6. Plan appropriate IOL as per support available. Thank you for your kind attention. Um, that was a nice yeah. uh, video with all the principles there. Uh, but then I noticed that your IUP was 25 and you have the active sentry and you also had the uh, active fluid eggs. So I don't know how you got, it was a surge which has essentially caused that uh, uh, PCR to happen. Yeah, um, so actually uh, what I noticed it at the time of uh, just before the last piece and I went over and over the video, the, how did this happen and when did it happen? Because, and the only thing I can fe I feel is that while doing the initial trenching, because I just stop and chop, during the initial trenching, the one part that the distal most part of the trench probably went a little deep and it touched the PC then. But because of the low IOP at the time of surgery throughout, like IOP, I normally keep it around 26, 27. And there was no disturbance. The nucleus rotated properly. The nuclear fragment removal was fine. So I really couldn't understand when the PC rent happened. Dr. Nitin, if there yeah. is a surge which has happened, not in that particular case, a surge has happened. Uh, would you uh, like to raise your IOP or would you like to lower it? So if there is a rent, then it is better to not increase the IOP because if you increase the IOP, 
then again that rent might you know spread further so it's better to keep the iop little low to prevent surge to prevent surge so to that prevent not happen yeah uh, surge is the thing which was happening in the machine at that point, yeah. point of time yeah. i think we would like to raise the iop in that yeah moment. then uh, yeah then you, you can increase the iop a little and, uh, so that the surge is minimal or yeah. minimize yeah, yeah so that and the other important thing we would do is to use a, a dispersive viscoelastic and uh, i suppose we would use a more retentive uh, viscoelastic any comments on that dr arup yeah uh, this is a wonderful uh, video a teaching video uh, excellent yes. video uh, but uh, this is a i think what I, I just uh, may differ from the, this he, he uh, give the viscoelastic in the once identified but I uh, prefer to give to plug the PC rent area yes. also viscoelastic. Yes. That is a, a specially dispersive yes. uh, with, yes. uh, without uh, and without any financial interest. I like that uh, visco would work yes. nicely in these cases to plug yes. these cases. And even then, uh, there is a uh, chance uh, if I have any intention to go uh, implant the single piece IOL whatever may be toric, <coughs> maybe multifocal lens, then I would prefer to do uh, stop the irrigation that time. I remove, I I, I will prefer to remove the cortex under this elastic, just by aspiration. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gopal, uh, would you want to uh, add anything about uh, use of tricord in this particular case? And if so, when would you want to use it? Like uh, no, the, this case, I think this case uh, the vitreous was condensed and then uh, actually there was no positive pressure. So, so, so that could that could be uh, that I think I think that has saved him from all the disasters of the uh, break and then doing all the cortical aspiration even after the break and then uh, able to put the lens. So if there is a positive pressure and then the break will extend, then there is a role of uh, the tricord to check whether the <coughs> vitreous tag is there or not. Like he rightly said, the vitreous space was intact, so that was not disturbed. So maybe maybe the age was uh, a little older age and then maybe a thin build and then the dehydrated vitreous. I think many things in this case particularly has saved, uh, saved us uh, for complete uh, successful removal. Dr. Satya, uh, one okay. last question. Yes, yeah. one last question. Now, uh, how would you plan the IOL part? You're going to, um, no. like when you tell your sister, now there has been a PCR and the lens was uh, kept on the bedside for uh, in the bag. So how would you advi advise or change the IOL part based on that specific case? No, in case if I'm going to implant a three piece IOL like this and capture the optic in the yes. back, there'll be no change. Only yes. if I'm going to place the lens totally in the sulcus, then yes. I'll ask sister to give 0.5 less. Yes. But or I'm... supposing it is going to be an IOL of a, of a different uh, A constant. Yeah. yeah. So, then uh, you then would. Back. Yeah, that's what. According to. Uh, so to be the, add, add the power to the thing and uh, uh, compensate for the uh, whether it's going to be placed in the sulcus or in the bag. So if it is going to be an optic capture and if the A constant is going to be the same, then you don't have to change anything at yes. all. Yes. If you are going to place it in the sulcus, you will decrease the IOL power by 0.5. And if it is going to be an IOL of a different material, then you would have to make adjustments for the uh, constant. Wonderful video, Dr. Ajit, and a lot of learning. Thank we you shall so now, much, man. I shall now go on to the next uh, 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 case, uh, case by Dr. Ameya Kulkarni, who's a young phaco refractive surgeon from Dr. Anil Kulkarni High Hospital at uh, Miraj. And he, let's see what he has to show. And a very warm welcome, Dr. Anagha. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. You should start, yeah. 
unmute yourself amia yeah, yeah i have unmuted uh at the outset i would like to thank dr chitra murthy and rest of the arc for giving me this uh, opportunity i'm just deviating slightly from the cataract videos i'll be presenting a, a video of uh, fakey kyle and uh, it's basically hydro implantation of the fakey kyle so no visco no headache is what i call it so what happens in icl what is the problem with icl icl the basic issue with icl is going to be your raised raised iop and why do you have raised iop is basically void sizing that you have to take care of pre operatively secondly retained viscoelastic so this retained viscoelastic is a major issue whatever you do in icl i feel it's very difficult to take out the entire viscoelastic once you've put in and it can give rise to anything from a transient uh, rise in iop to something as serious as urets zavalia syndrome so visco being the chief culprit of this issue so i thought it would be better if we can go ahead and not put any kind of visco elastic so i'm going to show you a video of what i do so this is basically loading up the iol even while loading the loading is not there is not much difference in loading of the iol uh, we don't use visco elastic even while loading so what happens if you use visco elastic the surface tension in the capsule increases and it tends to push your uh, lens outside so we try and avoid putting any kind of visco elastic it's it goes in absolutely well only with your hydro i'll just forward this and you can see there's absolutely no issues while loading this is me <clears throat> everything else while loading is the same there's no need for any visco elastic yeah so this was a case of basically toric icel you will see that we make the side ports first once we've made the side ports on both sides this is the irrigation uh, that goes in now generally i i keep the um, iop at around 70 mm on uh, the centurion for this and you can see the ac is well formed there are absolutely there is no movement of the iris that shows you that the ac is absolutely stable while we are inserting the lens and you can insert the lens as you are inserting the lens while uh, putting visco in there so there is absolutely no change in technique all the visco does is give you space the fluid will also do that so you have to be uh, you have to be equally careful and make sure uh, that it is unfolding the right way once uh, it does that tucking the iol is also the same there is absolutely no change in technique as we used to do earlier with visco elastics you will see that you can actually even rotate the lens without any problem this is me talking the plate haptics again so the irrigation is constantly there you can see there is absolutely no uh, the chamber is rock solid there is no problem it doesn't the lens doesn't touch the iol at all here and uh, this is me putting the air bubble uh, before we take the irrigation out once we've done that another point that we make uh, sure of is Uh, taking the adrenaline out of the anterior chamber and we do that by using another ba bag and which does not have adrenaline now the uh, advantage of that is uh, the pupil will start going down right on table once you take the entire adrenaline out 
and you don't have to put any kind of pilocarpin or anything for that. So yes, that uh, that was the video. The only thing that you need to be very careful is if it flips the wrong way, you need to use viscoelastic. That is, I think, the only uh, the reason why we use it. We've used it in ICL. We've also used it in, in IPCL from the care group. Both of them go fantastic uh, results. And there have been absolutely no issues with uh, patients, any kind of IOP rise post-op. Uh, another point to be noted is only the irrigation uh, should not be near the anterior capsule that causes some vacuolation on the anterior capsule, which also is basically transient. Otherwise, it's an absolutely safe and repeatable procedure. Thank you. Yes, uh, I mean, Dr. Amir, that was a very nice video and very uh, gracefully shown. But I think uh, it, it's each one to his technique. I have never, uh, I don't think a methyl cellulose is going to be an issue, but I have started uh, using Helon only for uh, play, implanting my ECL. So it comes out as a bolus. And, you know, uh, at least uh, for a, uh, you know, that suddenly uh, the lens, if it uh, turns or twists to you uh, just not having a viscoelastic is one uh, thought which you also brought out. Um, Dr. Nitin, would you want to add anything on this? Yeah, so I think uh, if I did not have a viscoelastic, then probably I would do this because out of 10 cases, you may find that in nine cases, you go very well with this, but there could be a sudden uh, a patient where you may have a flip, you know, and whenever there's a flip of the lens, then you have issues that could lead to, uh, you know, I wouldn't say a disaster, but it can lead to other problems. So probably that, and viscoelastic methyl cellulose, per mm -hmm. se, if you even leave a little bit As because of the aqua flow now in the central hole, we don't see so much of an IOP rise. So probably I would still uh, feel that uh, viscoelastic would be a safer bet and it would uh, give you a less surprise at any given point of time. Yes, Anagha? Yeah, just one comment. Excellent video, uh, Dr. Ameya. Uh, the incidence of IOP rise is really very, very low, number one. Number two, the left hand, the irrigation that you're using in the side port, actually your hand, one hand is just doing that, you know, because whenever we're using a second instrument while implanting with the right hand, for example, then that also helps to guide the opening up of the ICL if it is opening in the wrong direction. So it's not just for the irrigation. We use it basically not just to stabilize the globe, but to guide. Because in the ICL, it's very, very you know soft and very thin lens. So the chances of tilting and coming out in the opposite direction is uh, quite high. And not that high, but it is quite possible. So the second instrument actually guides it. And another thing is if the flow or the tilt or the flow is towards the uh, surface of the capsule, then again, there could be a little issue. And if there is a little shallowing, then you know you may scrape across the surface of the anterior lens capsule, which could be a little risky. So in your hands, it would work well, but I think in general, uh, we need to be a little cautious. Okay. Let's uh, going off this, since you're anyway talking ICL, uh, uh, the vaulting of the lens, if you have uh, left a little viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, and that would give us a little high vault on the first day. So don't go by the vault of the first day. You can call back the patient again and then recheck and then take a call whether, of course, you, it's ideal to do an ASOCT. Call them back after a couple of days and check and then take a call whether uh, there was a high vault or uh, it was See, just a very thing. See, if you're doing the uh, implanting in the irrigation and there is a, some kind of turbulation in the AC and the, that lens is very thin and yeah. you miss the second hand instrument to guiding the ICL whether it is flipping or not. So that uh, for the repetitive taping, I think viscoelastic uh, today I am using Helon and yeah. Helon is removed in you know, bulk and I never face any problem. Uh, Yes, HPMC, even HPMC, we did never, uh, but yes, now I will be Helong. Helong, the washing period is even very, very less, and that is more predictable. You uh, 
I think for the repetitive technique, once in a while, you may land up in a problem. So it is better to use uh, Helon or any kind of his elastic uh, yeah. for implantation. Also, many a times, some of uh, some of the eyes are very deep, and some of them have uh, very deep sunken sockets. And some patients in topical a little uncooperative. So that is where you have this buffer and uh, you can get away with some other problems if you have a viscoelastic. So I feel, uh, yeah, but of course, uh, probably Amaya, you showed a wonderful video and uh, probably in your hands, it works very well. But probably at times you may feel the need to have a viscoelastic also. Yeah. Uh, good question, sir. Dr. Amaya. Uh, yes, in, in any case, uh, was the, the I, I still got stuck in the injector uh, where, I mean, so you struggle because of... of uh, not the ICL, sir. I've had an issue with the IPCL flipping the wrong way. And as I said, uh, okay. yeah, so, so we had to put in uh, viscoelastic and uh, basically did not try to unflip it in the AC. Uh, we took it out uh, completely from the AC and then uh, again hydro implanted, it went well. So I've never had one with ICL, but IPCLs, yes, they are slightly notorious in unfeeping the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Amir. That's a, a, definitely a technique to adopt. Uh, Dr. Ashi, Dr. Dr. Dipali wants to say something. I was just saying that if you want to use hydro implantation, then I think you can use an AC maintainer instead of using a bimanual so that your other hand is free for other manipulation. You can use a dialer along with that. AC material can sometimes go out of control. It can go and touch if AC shallows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't use AC maintainer for a, such a one-minute procedure. Dr. Ashu Agarwal has not joined in. So we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Ashu, could you call Dr. Ashu Agarwal? Uh, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Gagandeep Brar, who um, is a very leading uh, dynamic surgeon from Chandigarh and uh, he is going to be uh, showing an interesting case of his. Thank you, Madam. Uh, and I thank the ARC for having me uh, on the platform today. I hope you can see the slide here and yes, hear yes. me. Okay. Yes. So in the era of uh, the flanged uh, suturing of lenses, I'll take you through a case, uh, a more traditional suturing of a three-point or a pseudo-four-point suturing of an intraocular lens, and also at the same time, repairing a traumatic uh, no midriasis. Now, here was a 56-year-old male, uh, had trauma into the right eye with a thick rope almost a month back, and somebody attempted a FACO and had a nucleus rock. And on presentation, we could note that his vision was good, best corrected vision was good. There was obviously aphicia, vitreous in the AC, as well as in the incision, a dropped nucleus and hypotony and a fully dilated pupil. So the first thing uh, we did was uh, clear the incision, the vitreous from the incision, close the incision with a suture. That, that was the first thing to take care of the hypotony. Uh, and close the incision with a single suture. And then fashion a scleral tunnel for the intraocular lens. We were planning a PMMA single eyelet uh, intraocular lens and also created two scleral pockets, approximately 2.25 millimeter, 180 degree apart uh, with a short pocket uh, for bearing the knot um, of the scleral fixation. And uh, once uh, these, these uh, tunnels were created, then you simply go in, uh, do a little bit of uh, that uh, no vitrectomy. This is done by the retina surgeon, not by me. I'll acknowledge him here. And uh, you can see the attempted FACO with those holes in the nucleus. So once that nucleus, big nucleus fragment was free from the vitreous, it was emulsified with the fragmentome. And that's after, after that was done was the role of the secondary uh, lens fixation. And at this point of time, uh, finally, you would enter the anterior chamber uh, and uh, make your uh, tunnel. Uh, and then uh, going with this uh, long needle 9 or a 10 proline, I think I would prefer a 9 proline 
uh, in cases. And uh, obviously, you you use the railroad technique to bring it out of the, the main incision and then go through the eyelet of uh, this uh, PMMA lens. The only thing, and then come out from the same tunnel, railroading it through the ab external 26 gauge needle and keep them approximately at the end of uh, the, the tunnel that you have created over there and do the same thing on the other side. Uh, it is a little tricky uh, with the left hand for right-handed surgeons. So you see me going across uh, and then coming back uh, to facilitate uh, an easier egress from the main incision and then going back uh, the same way uh, through that tunnel and then tucking in the lens. The only thing over a period of uh, time, what I have realized is when you go through that uh, hole in the uh, the eyelet in the haptic, uh, on one side you should go in from uh, you no know, top to uh, you no know, from over uh, to down, and then on the opposite on the other side, so that you don't induce a torque uh, on the on the lens when you finally suture. And once you have done that, uh, at the end you have a nicely centered lens. And the only thing here, and a fourth row uploplasty uh, that you see here. So this case actually did well uh, with the, just these two sutures and uh, post-operatively almost a week after the procedure. He's 6'9 with a 1.25 diopter cylinder. You saw me uh, complete uh, you know, the suturing of the lens without suturing the main incision because the, the tunnel of the main incision was holding well. But uh, I would advise that you always uh, kind of suture the main incision before you finally suture the lens. Uh, I thank you all for patient hearing. A very nice, uh, very sleekly done surgery and uh, um, highly appreciate your uh, surgical skill. Um, going on to the question, uh, uh, would I take this question from uh, anybody, Dr. Nitin? Um, uh, what uh, uh, would you do? You suggest that uh, uh, the suture or the glued iol would be a better way to go, or uh, these are just two different techniques. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. So I used to have done a lot of scleral sutured iol, but I've seen that a lot of them now after 15 years. Some after 12 years have started dislocating. That is mainly because the suture is giving way. It is degrading. Yeah. So and probably uh, I think uh, the uh, glued iron would be a better option. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, since you do... Uh, Srinivas Doshi, are you there? It's not there. Uh, okay, uh, going on to Dr. Gagan, uh, would you uh, yes. suggest that uh, in these cases of nucleus drop, uh, I suppose a complete vitrectomy is uh, absolutely mandatory, uh, yes. for, uh, especially with the history of Srinivas. In these kind of nucleus drop, I suppose a complete vitrectomy is mandatory and you should also look at the periphery to look, lose out, uh, I mean, sorry, you don't miss out any, uh, any other further injury from the primary trauma. I suppose you would do that, right? Uh, very uh, pertinent question, madam. In fact, a few of the studies have shown that if there is a nuclear matter, then any small it is, it has to be removed. But whereas the cortex matter, if it is less than one third, it can still be observed. There is no mandatory that you have to remove it. It can still be observed. But if there is any part of the nuclear material which is falling into the vitreous cavity, it has to be uh, removed irrespective of whatever it is. Otherwise, it is going to incite the a silent intermediate uveitis in the coming future. Yeah. So we might not know why, why it is happening, although it might get absorbed, but still that kind of irritation and inflammation might persist. So yeah. it is always advisable to do a complete vitrectomy with PVD induction and then checking up the peripheral indentation, as you said rightly, and then go ahead with the, the secondary IOL implant later. Uh, but if uh... If a secondary, uh, if the nucleus drop had not happened and it was just a clear cut uh, SFIO being done for a, a fake status uh, in a PCR kind of a situation, I suppose just a, a anterior vitrectomy or a little uh, mid vitrectomy should suffice, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, we vitreoidal surgeons would love to do it in a parse planar route. 
but yeah. even uh, even the anterior segments can just do an anterior vitrectomy and make sure that you use a dilated IVTA and use it, stain it in the anterior segment to make sure that there is no vitreous strands or anything in the vitreous, uh, sorry, in the anterior segment. And then you can, uh, depending upon the, the extent of the PCR, you can place the eye. There's no uh, need to do a complete vitrectomy in these cases if there is no complete, if there is no drop of the nucleus. Anything to add, Dr. Rishi, in this particular case? You're muted, uh, Dr. Rishi. I think another reasonable option is to think about the iris clip lens. Yes. It really makes everything much easier nowadays. I've started using Even secondary that. secondary glaucoma is another complication if you leave the cortex. Not only you mm, think exactly. the cortex will absorb, yeah. uh, even in the cortical matter, some cases they'll end up in black glaucoma. Yeah. No, I think uh, since the whole process is not difficult at all, it is better to clear up the mess in the vitreous. Yes, Dr. Amaya, you have anything to add? Yeah, the, Dr. Nitin sir just said about the degradation of the suture. Uh, yes. Would using Gore-Tex be a better option than Proly? Yeah, Gore-Tex would definitely be, but the availability of Gore-Tex is a problem because that is something which is not freely available. I'm, I'm not sure about Dr. Srinivas can um, sir, tell us. Gore-Tex Gore is going to be the best. Whether you take uh, tenoproline, ninoproline or whatever, it gives you a good fixation, a four-point fixation and definitely any futuristic, if you want to do any retinal surgery, like you're using any silicon oil or gas tampon or anything, I think Gore-Tex suture, it is going to have a good, uh, less tilt and less dislocation uh, and less degradation also as compared to the proline sutures. Is it available? In Sir, it's available in Mumbai itself. Achha, okay. So between glued IRL and Gore-Tex, would, what would you prefer? I would still go for Gore-Tex. So as an anterior segment surgeon, I would do an iris clip yeah. because it's I much think. easier and you won't much believe easier in to an manage. earlier webinar, I was caught alone with the retina surgeons. So they actually literally tried their best to throw the iris <laughs> clip into the dustbin, and I valiantly protected it. We but now. But Chitra, now even the and even the posterior segment surgeon, due to paucity of time, they also have fallen to that. I'm not so sure. Uh, not not everyone, sir. I would I would slightly like to beg to disagree with this statement uh, <laughs> because somehow for the vitreoidal surgeons, iris clip lens or iris claw lens is still a debatable topic because further there might be a chance of any of these oil or gas coming into the AC. And if gas comes into the AC, then it will cause a very bad glaucoma or even the endothelial decompensation also. That's the reason which we avoid iris claw from the VR purpose. Oh, but iris let's not go into the debate of it. Yeah. yeah we go on to an, uh, thank you, Dr. G Gagandeep. That was wonderful. We go on to our next case, Dr. to be presented by Dr. Jay Prasad Baskaran from uh, who heads the Kuchi Eye Center, Aluwa. And he has an interesting case to show. On to you, Dr. Jay Prasad. Dr. Harshul? You wanted something, ma'am? No, no, I wanted to. Uh, I didn't see Harshul for a while, so I just wanted to have him include. Could you unmute yourself, Dr. Jay Prasad? Sorry for that. Oh. Can you see my screen? Yes. So good evening, all of you. At the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Chitra, the ARC team, for this opportunity. Today, I will. Uh, am I audible? Yes, doctor. Yeah. So I will show you two small clippings. The first one was a hypermature cataract, where with a small pupil, where I am using iris hooks, and then uh, phaco emulsification of the nucleus 
without the cortex creating a pseudo nuclear pseudo cortex a pseudo epinucleus with a dispersive ovd and then we'll come to the problems that i face let us start is it running it's running but we ah uh, yes your yeah. viewers so i have hooked the pupil very slow this is a very slow surgery this is my real time uh, real time it's not a slowed uh, procedure 200 vacuum very low vacuum actually step by step i am splitting the nucleus it was a direct shock i have almost finished i go very slow when in in such situations because the pc can come up any time and here the capsule is at the tip so i am have frozen i have stopped aspiration at this point of time i don't uh, press on the reflex button because then you will have hydrate the vitreous i go gently with a dispersive ovd first through the side port and then inject over that bare area where there is no capsule on that side on the opposite side keeping everything still and once i have formed the anti hm i have stopped irrigation now only the dispersive ovd here i'm trying to see whether i can release the capsule from the phaco tip it has released once the ac is reasonably formed i stop my phaco hand piece comes out then i go with a cohesive ovd inject into the bag and the bag opens up nicely goes back into its original position then i inject i introduce a ring ctr into the bag through from the opposite side inject more of ovd onto the area with dialysis and then go ahead very slowly and emulsify rest of the nucleus and implant a three piece lens into the bag it goes in nicely and then i remove the iris hooks after washing out the ovd so that is the first case the first part now the second case is a regular um cataract regular phaco emulsification a hard cataract Di well dilated pupil well dilated pupil and here uh, i finished the case extremely well post op was uneventful and at the end of four weeks once i started tapering of steroids the patient started getting an uveitis then once again stepped up steroids uh, i did an ind indirect to see whether there was anything in the fundus nothing uh, i did a b scan to see whether there were the vitreous was clear the vitreous was clear the bag was clean only thing is the patient once the uh, steroids were being tapered uh, the inflammation was increasing so let us have a look at this so we had this alternate diagnosis of a delayed chronic endophthalmitis but then i thought let us examine little more closely this is actually on the table the a second time i have taken the patient into the theater this patient developed a severe cystoid macular edema i did a gonioscopy this is an intraoperative gonioscope indirect gonioscope actually and if you look carefully inferior ankle it will come to picture now some some a small bit here you can see that small bit of nucleus sitting in the ankle hidden by the thick arcus inferiorly that was sitting at the root of the iris on to the surface of the trabecular meshure so i used a swan jacob lens a gonioscope and using a sinski hook under ovd then ac was filled with ovd pupil constricted with pilocarpin and then teased it out out into the anterior chamber and then taken out with two sinski hook hooks through a small opening 
So here, what I want to convey is, if you have a recurrent inflammation, you should uh, post-operatively, please have this as also, this also as an alternate diagnosis, and please never forget to do a gonioscope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for very much for two very nice learning videos, Dr. Jay Prasad. So now when we are talking about hypermature cataract, so I would uh, uh, ask Rishi on this. Uh, uh, now, how? what are the tips which you can give to chop a, a mobile endonucleus in a hypermature cataract, Dr. Rishi? I think one of the things which is key is to have a good sized rexis. If your rexis is too small, yeah. then you will definitely end up uh, stressing the zonules in a hypermature already. Your capsule and zonules are going to be fragile. So good size rexis, use of pan blue in every such case because you know if the pupil comes down on you, then your visibility sometimes becomes an issue. And uh, using the right OVD cannot be, uh, I think, uh, emphasized enough. Uh, some high density OVD is a good idea uh, to make sure that you get uh, a good flat capsule, especially during the rexis and also to keep everything a little stable. And using a chopper, you know, I think uh, that's uh, very useful, especially when your nucleus is a bulky and it is moving around. Uh, you don't need to stress the zonules that much if you use a sharp chopper. I think these yeah. things uh, are some things you have to keep in mind. And of course, if you're if you have any doubt that your zonules are weak, don't hesitate to put a capsular tension ring or um, a, a capsule uh, hook. That makes mm -hmm. everything much more uh, controlled. Dr. Satyamurti, would you want to use a my loop or would you think of using an IOL scaffold in these cases? Exactly. Yeah. I am coming to that only, ma'am. Actually, I wanted to tell that uh, mm -hmm. you can put the moment you make a rexis, you put the lens that you want to place in the bag mm -hmm. and then over it, the decomposition becomes very easy. Mm -hmm. so I have tried in a couple of cases, it has worked well. And I think another important uh, thing which she said is placing a CTR also. Uh, if you have not placed the IOL in the bag, placing a CTR is absolutely necessary because the bag can be very floppy and uh, that will be protective. But in your particular case, Dr. Jay Prasad, that area of dialysis were nearly, uh, more, nearly more than four clock hours. I'm not sure whether CTR would suffice, but the only good news is that... Uh, uh, iatrogenic dialysis are not progressive, so maybe mm, the end result was fine. You're wrong, so, madam. Uh, Actually, um, the lens descended after six months because the zonular dialysis, as you said correctly, was more than five clock hours. So yeah. you should always put in a Sionis ring and anchor. You, it needs some sort of an anchoring in, when you have uh, more than four clock hours of sonular dialysis, particularly in a hypermature cataract, shrunken cataract, where other sonules are also very weak. So uh, that is a very important point. Please remember that this lens descended after four or five months. So I had to re-center uh, it again and anchor it to the sclera. Thank Another you. you Yes, ma'am. So I just want uh, excellent video, sir, and, uh, nice learning tips. So in the first case, sir, uh, basically when it's a very small mobile nucleus, I think stabilizing with the other instrument is very, very important. And many times in spite of that, it will keep moving. So use of uh, viscoelastic, repeated use of viscoelastics to create more space between the nucleus and the PC. You know, many times as you're doing the FACO, the visco washes out. So maybe replenishing it again and again, maybe slightly. No, all such uh, hypermature and harder cataracts, I inject OVDs at least six times. If it is three, four, and or five. Uh, reduce the Probably vacuum towards times. the end. Towards the end of the... Uh, towards the end, my the strategy, uh, Anaka, is to reduce the vacuum as what Dr. Abe Vasada has told us to use step down uh, FACO. That means as you progress towards the uh, last part, you always bring down the vacuum. I do the, my last piece is always eaten at 75 or 100. And second point is always keep that left side side port very small where you are introducing your uh, chopper or dialer. Keep it optimally small just for that to snugly fit so that you won't have excess of leak through that and have a sudden surge. Thanks. 
Absolutely. Anything yeah. else, Thanks. Jada, expert panel, yeah. Dr. Jitin or Dr. Yeah. Yeah. The final I point he made sure. is very useful that, you know, do a gonioscopy whenever you have recurrent yes. inflammation. But Absolutely. one more point yeah. I like to add to that is if you're getting recurrent edema, focal, mm -hmm. especially in the inferior part of your cornea, again, that can point to yeah. a possible yes, yes. nuclear fragment. Yes. So yeah. if you're getting unexplained edema, especially in the lower part of the cornea, please do a gonioscopy again to look for a piece. Yes. Well said. Very important. Dr. Nitin, anything to and, add? Uh, yeah, you can also use a burst mode because if there's too much of movement of the nucleus, just impale it and in the burst mode you can try to break the nucleus and then see how it goes and slowly, slowly as the nucleus comes in, then you can change to the normal mode. Yes, uh, yes. Just uh, one thing to add. Uh, if you have a four, four o'clock hour genular dialysis and you want to don't fix it in the, the caps uh, with the sclera, put a CTR and put a multi-piece oil in the sulcus and capture the optic. That yeah. is a much safer option than putting the single piece oil in the bag. Yes, yes. So, yeah, generally in cases of pseudo exfoliation with mild to moderate weakness, I always use a three-piece eye oil in the sulcus with an optic capture. And I have a series now which has been published in the IJO two months back. That oh, is an excellent, good. what you said is absolutely correct. Always in the sulcus with an optic capture. Yeah. And yeah. I generally put a small opening in the anterior capsule peripherally, uh, the, what I call as a peripheral anterior capsulotomy, capsulotomy, an opening in the anterior capsule so that you will never get a capsular distension syndrome. In, because you are trapping the lens optic in the anterior capsular opening, it will be sealed, the bag will be sealed. So there is never a chance if you put an opening like you do your peripheral iridotomy, if you put a capsulotomy, which you can easily do with your 26 gauge needle. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jay Prasad, and wonderful tips from your video. We uh, go on to our next speaker, Dr. Mohammed Faisal, who's a, a young uh, dynamic consultant from. Uh, the I Foundation group of hospitals based at Tirnar Valley. He's a specialist in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery. And he's going to show his complex case. On to you, Faisal. Thank you, ma'am. Is my video visible? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yas, for giving me this opportunity. All those uh, previous videos were excellent. I've learned a lot from that. Thank you all. And uh, I thought I'll be uh, I'll be showing a, I'll show a, a video of uh, regular FACO in a, in the heart cataract. We all know that the rate of intraoperative complications are significantly higher in cases of rock heart cataracts. So in this video, let us analyze and strategize how to tackle these difficult cases. So the visualizing of the anterior capsule is always a challenge in this case. So it is better to stain it with trifan blue. Although the anterior capsule doesn't stand out as much in uh, as much as in white cataract, but still its visualization is significantly improved. So ideally, in this denser cataract, it is necessary to make slightly bigger excess, maybe around 5.5 uh, millimeter, and a uh, very gentle hydro dissection is uh, done. It can be done in multiple multiple quadrants to make sure that uh, there's no addition between the capsule and the nucleus. The capsule in these uh, cases will be thinner and uh, the aggressive hydro might uh, blow the posterior capsule. Uh, dividing, uh, dividing the nucleus is uh, going to be the most challenging part in this case. The posterior plates uh, in this denser nucleus are uh, very difficult to crack. I myself comfortable with stop and chop technique and my settings for the trenching is uh, power I use 660, vacuum 80 and the aspiration is uh, 28. Uh, while uh, trenching the nucleus, uh, it is uh, always make a broader group for your uh, sleep to enter in and uh, don't push the nucleus as it might cause uh, zonular weakness. Gradually move your phaco tip forward. Uh, you can very well appreciate it cutting and gaining access into the endonucleus. Try to reach 80 to 90 percentage of depth so that uh, it will be easy to separate the nucleus. And uh, next comes the cracking. I usually crack the nucleus, separate the nucleus from the periphery as if I am uh, I'm sharing the cardboard or the paper. Uh, whenever required, rotate the nucleus and uh, complete the trenching part in the other side also. And uh, 
once the glow is clear and that, that that's the time that uh, you start track you start separating the nucleus and make sure the posterior plates are separated uh, without uh, separating the posterior plate then it will be very difficult for the further manipulation just take your time don't be hurry to handle uh, any hard cataract so make sure the posterior plates are uh, neatly cracked and uh, once uh, it is done next is uh, heminucleus uh, fragmentation i usually prefer to go for uh, uh, sharp chopper for this maneuver so bury the tip deep into the substance of the nucleus and slightly uh, lift the nucleus now the vertical chopper goes down and then uh, we have a lateral separation so so you can see that my hold of the nucleus is not strong that's why i'm not able to crack the nucleus so always make sure that the hold of the nucleus is good to have a good crack without cracking it it will be very difficult for a further maneuver so make sure the nucleus is cracked uh, till the posterior plate the same maneuver is repeated uh, till the whole uh, nucleus is cracked uh, into 6 to 8 small pieces so in this step also you can see that my hold is not strong that's why i'm not able to crack and now i am burying the tip further deep and now i can hold the nucleus strong and i can separate the nucleus and make sure all the fragments are inside the bag till the nucleus are cracked uh, next is fragment emulsification so we all know that the reason for striate keratitis are uh, anterior plane of emulsification and the lens chatter so to have a clear cornea post operatively always uh, do your uh, emulsification in the posterior plane and uh, to prevent the lens chatter and turbulence uh, set parameters right and use uh, use foot pedal to deliver appropriate amount of energy and while removing the fragments it will be better to have a uh, smaller pieces the chopper is placed in such a way that the nuclear pieces are pieces doesn't uh, chatter and touch the endothelium make sure to repeatedly fill the anterior chamber with with, with viscoelastics and uh, emulsification of uh, last fragments is always a challenge so you have to reduce the parameters and try to keep the nucleus at the tip of the phaco probe as much as possible and uh, by this you can take care of uh, posterior capsule and endothelium thank you wonderful uh, uh, video uh... Faisal, and you explained all the steps uh, beautifully. Uh, Dr. Arup, I would want to ask you. Uh, yeah. uh, now uh, he showed a nice, graceful surgery. Uh, so these are some cases where an early surgeon could have a wound burn. So, yeah. what would you advise? Uh, See, uh, wound burn is a is a, uh, is a excess of heat, and heat generated when that it is not neutralized by the it is either blockage of the tip. or your uh, your wound is very tight so it's yes. a better to have a slightly leaky wound uh, rather yes. than a very snugly fitted room in cases of a heart cataract where you intend to use very high energy because of the most of the cases this uh, cases this like these may need a high energy may continue a surgery for long so uh, it must have a very and you have to remove all the viscoelastic before applying any kind of trenching because viscoelastic especially viscoat can plug the uh, phaco tip and you just start away, uh, using power then it can create a wound burn so you remove the all the viscoelastic uh, in the aspiration mode with the phaco tip and then you start using your power that's uh, the is uh, a few tips for prevention of uh, one it should Very be it should not be snugly fitted uh, main wound that yes. your tip should not be blocked if it is a there is a occlusion should not you should not press the foot pedal and always remove all viscoelastic yes. before using uh, any power and uh, if it's a tight wound it could be a kink sleeve and that itself could block the flows or all that it has to be kept in mind you have shown the entire surgery very well faisal but i'm going to ask uh, dr rishi here if you have a flat petri kind of a situation which would happen in these kind of hard cataract how would you advise a youngster to deal with that moment unmute uh, rishi unmute you sorry 
sometimes if i end up with that flower petal kind of a, this thing it's it's actually a blessing in this guys all you have to do is find a little opening put uh, a dense ovd behind that posterior plate and i use a sinski hoop to actually uh, pull the center of that flower petal anteriorly and i start emulsifying from the center and then all the pieces come in very nicely so right. i think that's a very useful thing even if you are struggling to uh, crack the posterior plate you can just kind of make little little pieces and one area if you can get a find an opening to there you can put ovd and then lift the central central uh, plate there, up is there any thought about doing a divide and conquer in some of these very hard cataracts would anybody suggest it or nobody would i think the most key thing is to use a sharp chopper ma'am uh, i find the rajan chopper has been a blessing ever since i started using it in these hard cataracts it really yeah. goes all the way deep yes yes uh, almost uh, always you'll end up cracking it it's yeah yeah yes and then needle shaped chopper basically yes. it's a combo chopper this is work nicely in cases of hard cataracts beautiful and the fundamental of this is central divulking whether you are doing center cater whether you are doing a large uh, 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 trenching whatever you just have to remove the hardest part as much as possible by sculpting so this is the key to success and even then there is a power petal kind of thing and as dc said that's a wonderful tips for get away from this power petal uh, dr dr gopal raju anything to add or shall we take your yeah mainly we have to uh, debulk right. and mentally yeah in the center mentally you should prepare for a slightly longer you should not get uh, and another uh, important i think you have done uh, the rexis size should be slightly larger size so that is one precaution we should take then everything will go smooth wonderful we shall down thank you faisal for, for the wonderful thank video you. we go on to our next uh, surgery uh, dr nivedita narayan would be showing she is a senior consultant in cornea refractive and cataract surgery from shankar netralia chennai and she is going to take us a little uh, different route uh from the regular surgeries which you have seen now on to you dr nivedita my slides are visible yeah yeah okay so so this was a 54 year old am i audible yes yeah, yes yeah. yeah so a 54 year old lady came with a history of bilateral childhood trauma and she developed scar after that right eye more than the left she was managing her life with that she complained of a gradual drop in vision in both the eyes uh, on examination you can see significant scar with an adherent lipoma in the right eye and left eye also has a scar and uh, best corrective visual acuity right eye was counting finger close to face whereas left eye was 624 so basically she is managing with her left eye only so we did a potential acuity meter which showed an improvement in the right eye to 618 so technically it could be the better eye so we decided to attempt for a surgery in the right eye combined corneal with the uh, cataract so if i could get away with uh, dmec though the asocity shows very dense cataract uh, corneal changes throughout uh, in the central there is a density less so decided to do a layer by technique layer by layer removal of the cornea and see if i could manage with an lk or a dalk along with faco so let's see how i managed so 7.5 mm i marked with a guarded trifin 300 microns i entered inferiorly in the scar area i did not get go through well so i used a separate blade then the first layer dissection i did the density of the scar was still more superiorly it cleared somewhat central was not good so i did a second layer removal so the area of the ooze is the, actually the perforation i put an ovd on top the visibility was good so i proceeded with faco stain the ca capsule there was an adherent um, 
central uh, plot like thing in the capsule so i left that area and did the rexes all around i did not remove it fully i crumpled them and kept it on top of the block then i made a main entry used a special forceps to gently remove the capsule without disturbing much so once the rexes was done well i had the confidence to do the fico hydro dissection have used an extra illumination and uh, carefully slowly fico was possible the inferior zone was blocked by the scar so i used the space through which my visibility was better i literally moved the eye to the side where i could see better after reasonable cortical clean up i could not see much inferiorly whether cortical clean up is complete or not so i'm using a light pipe to distort so to see which zones i have to clean which i did later so once i was satisfied i satisfied with that i extended the section put a hydrophobic single piece lens in the back the most important thing is to get the leading haptic into the bag the trailing will uh, follow for a little bit nudge and then it is pushed inside that way manipulations can be minimized so once that was done i wanted to remove one more layer uh, now i am remove separating the synechia up until that time i did not do anything synechia released now the perforation had not increased so i am emboldened to remove one more layer i was contemplating whether i can do an uh, air injection big bubble or something but i didn't have the heart to do it in case it extends the um um perforation so i layer by layer i removed all over the area that's beyond the scope of this video so i'm just going to show only the first uh, clip of uh, removal so the same thing i repeated all over gently and carefully over which i put the uh, dalk graft suturing as usual i combine interrupted with uh, continuous so that was the end result the day one post op was looking good patient unaided vision was 624 which is on par with the other good eye so i am happy the patient is also happy thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity yeah wonderful surgery dr nivedita i mean i've been seeing your videos uh, each of them are a challenge uh, can you uh, un uh, and share dr rishi i felt there was significant uh, uh, residual uh, opacity uh, which could impact outcome so could it have been just a a dal procedure which was primarily done and probably since the cataract was not significant could the cataract surgery have been done after the whole eye stabilizes the astigmatism becomes better manageable so i uh, think that's a reasonable approach to have done it in two steps because uh, visibility was quite poor and uh, we're lucky no, there was no complication but Uh, i think nivedita did a brilliant job and uh, got a, i'm sure this patient will do very well may not reach 66 or 69 but even if you get a 612 or a 618 i think that's a really good achievement in such a eye uh, but i would have probably as dr chitra mentioned done it in two steps i would have first done the dalk and uh, improved my visualization and wait for, waited for the sutures to come out and then probably planned my fake emulsification but or this many ways to skin a cat so or do you think this could have been the original indication for doing a pk and if the graft were to fail to follow it up with a dmac or a dsec uh, i don't think i would have done a pk i would have always attempted to do a dalk first because if you see her oct the cornea was quite compact which means that the endothelium is functioning so even a pre dysmetic dalk like she has done sometimes with time the stroma remodels and uh, you may not get so much of um 
visual effect because of that. So even if you get a 612 kind of an outcome, it's a very good outcome for this kind of a patient. So Supposing it had been a vascularized corneal scar, would that have changed your treatment strategy? All the more important to do a dialic in a vascularized scar because PK, the chances of rejection are higher and um, then the whole uh, outcome kind of significantly survived. There been more interface vascularization in a vascularized scar? That so, yes, matter. that is certainly a possibility, but uh, if you can go deep enough, then the chances of interface vascularization is lesser. Okay. Uh, doctor, I add a few things. Yes. Just one, just one question. Oh, yeah. Can I ask? Yes, yes, Praveen. Of course, you are, any of you all can ask. Yes. Uh, so how to assess the endothelial functioning status in these cases when there is a severe corneal opacity? You cannot check whether the endothelium is good or not. Uh, so, and while performing phaco emulsification also, because you have poor visibility, you tend to do the phaco emulsification more in the anterior chamber rather than you uh, in the iris plane or in the bag, in the capsular bag, because you tell, you may rupture the PC and all those things. In those cases, uh, I'm a little bit worried in this case to perform uh, phaco emulsification rather than perform something else. Uh, Two-stage procedure would have been the best, I think. Yeah. Uh, anybody else, anything before we go on? A wonderful video. Just, just, just uh, two points. Uh, yes. the, related to your questions, whether PK would have been better. One, um, Dr. Lisi, I think uh, he has discussed all the points. Another point yeah. is that it was a young patient. So young patient, PKP, always carries a poor problem. Second, you rightly asked what is the risk of interface vascularization. Now all the studies, they have proven. If you are doing a dark in a patient of healed keratitis, then you have to continue steroid for a very prolonged period or else there will be stromal rejection and vascularization. All these things can occur. So in all these patients, steroid has to be control, uh, continued for a, a long time. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add, if I may. Yeah. Now, yes. This patient, from the history, it was evident that she has been having this scar all her life and she has been managing like yeah. uh, how Jitra ma'am had uh, noticed, the cataract was not so significant. So mm -hmm. the cataract in the right eye has just added a little bit. The patient yeah. has actually been maintaining with her left eye. So left eye is the primary eye. And in that, when she developed cataract and it started diminishing, now the patient is having the problem. So right eye could be an amblyopic eye. That one option is deal only with the left eye in stage procedure. Or the other option is, while the left eye is still functional, try and do what we can do for the right eye. So that was my attitude. When I did the potential acuity meter and the vision improved somehow miraculously to 618, that was very tempting. So that was the reason why I chose to operate on the right eye. The patient was insistent on doing something for the left eye. So when it comes to right eye, if I tell her, We'll do one step procedure and then again, you have to come. We are not sure. The patient was not very happy. So that was also the reason why I decided to attempt both in one go in the right eye. And uh, somehow she got good vision. So I think I got away lucky. Thank you. Thank you, Nivedita. Uh, a wonderful one, case. With one question. Wonderful guess. Wonderful. Just one question I had was about the IOL power. Like, was there any uh, difference in your calculation when you decided to do a dialc with cataract or? When we are able to get a good um, keratometry, we go by the keratometry value. I will master if it is possible, if we take. In this case, it was not possible. Then we go opt on to the manual uh, um, keratometry. Certain situations where we cannot go for the manual keratometry also, then we go by the other eye or standard key. That is our but if you are going to do a case, it's better to go with a standard K because the case standard. completely change. Yes, ah. yes, yes. Standard K is the way to go. Standard K, or you can just check what is your uh, post of K taking a reg regression data from past uh, PK that you have done, and you can take that also as keratometry. No, I have not calculated for my DALC. And uh, these are with scar. We leave some residual scar. So it's going to be very different. In fact, uh, I would have, even if I was doing a combined case, I would probably want to put the lens secondarily. Uh, but then, like you said, in this case, doing a, uh, yeah. another surgery, to convincing her would have been difficult. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. We shall go on to our next talk, Dr. Nikunj Dhan.
who is a senior consultant, Cornea and Cataract Services at SRJ Netralia. And let us see his video. I think I'll have to take go on a little fast gear because there are many more surgeons yet. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Chitra ma'am and uh, uh, Harshul Taksar and the team ARC for giving the opportunity. Uh, the last case was wonderful. It was amazing to watch the outcome. I'll, I'll just uh, share my video. Uh, it's about, uh, so uh, when we plan a, uh, any kind of toric IOL in a routine case, it is an easy job. But when we face a case where uh, RK is done with a 16 cut with irregular cornea, and if patient is demanding, and I mean, patient wants something better, whatever best we can do. So I'm sharing a case of planning and uh, a non-diffractive EDOF toric IOL, VBT uh, toric, uh, no financial interest in a post RK patient with a 16 cut RK. Uh, Hello. When you talk about non defective extended to focus toric IOL in a post RK patient with a 16 cut, challenges with the post radial keratotomy eyes are difficult IOL calculation due to irregular cornea. Managing patient expectations that they would want a refractive solution and a different surgical planning as there are so many challenges in interoperativity. In the current era of presbytery correcting IOLs, we have a lot of options in the form of refractive IOLs, but they have limitations when it comes to post radial keratotomy cancer. I'm going to share a case of a 55 year old gentleman who had undergone radial keratotomy for his high myopia 30 years back. His refractive error showed mixed astigmatism. He had grade 3 nucleosclerosis and 16 radial keratotomy cuts. The first step in managing such cases is counseling of the patient and you need to give your chair time to explain that it is difficult to achieve independence completely from glasses. The second step and one of the biggest challenge is to determine the correct spherical intraocular power calculation in such eyes as best of the best IL Master 700 also had blank report. The corneal topography showed flat cornea with a little bit of irregular astigmatism. For such cases, we need to use online calculator for post-RK patients provided by American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, where we need to fill the data including post-RK refraction, pre-RK refraction if it is available, and data from corneal topography and optical biometers. So at the end, it will provide us a range of IL powers, and we need to determine which one we need to put. For post-RK patients, we aim to target myopia post-operatively, and in this case, I decided to implant 26 diopter IOL. Next step is historical calculation, and for that, it is important to know which keratometry values to use. After comparing the keratometry values between IL Master and the photography scan EKR map, I decided to use the values from 4.5 mm EKR values, which showed 2.6 diopter of astigmatism. The historical calculation was done using online calculator. The next step is surgical planning. After doing reference axis marking on slit length, the final toric axis marking is done before starting the surgery. The side for incisions are made between the RK cuts. Avoid overfilling of the OBD in the anterior chamber. I decided to make transconjunctival sclerocorneal corneal incision in this case, as this was a case of 16 cut RK, and there was a very little space between the two RK cuts. Coexil elimination helps to get the better view. Capsular access is done of a circular fashion of adequate size, just like a routine case. The factor parameters also needs to be changed, and uh, low irrigation, low IOP, and low vacuum needs to be used. It is important not to let the anterior chamber collapse and always inject OVD before removing the irrigation source. Irrigation aspiration of the cortex is done just like routine case. A 26 diopter non defective head of toic IOL is implanted into the back. It is very important to remove OVD behind the IOL before aligning the toric IOL to the final axis. Patient had good visual and refractive outcome, and he was able to read 6 12 for distance and N10 for near without glasses. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, 
Thanks a lot, Dr. Nikun. That was a very uh, lot of information packed in the four minutes. Um, very good, uh, very good. Uh, now, uh, you had uh, suggested an EDOF lens for this particular patient? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, he wanted to have some kind of solution if he can for near vision also because his near vision was also significantly affected because of his cataract and he had missed, mixed astigmatism with a little bit of hyperopia. So, hyperopia with presbyopia and uh, irregular cornea post-RK. Uh, so, uh, I explained him that it's not possible to achieve the complete independence from the glasses. And so, uh, any kind of he actually wanted a trifocal lens because he heard somewhere that trifocal gives independence from glasses. So I told, told straightforwardly told him that trifocal is not possible. So uh, either we can go for this non-defective uh, EDOF lens uh, that is VBT and uh, uh, the toric calculation I will do, but I cannot promise that uh, I will be able to neutralize complete cylinder because it is not possible to calculate the exit axis in such cases. So, so, probably using a VVT or an eye hands would be the way to go. Yes, Anaga, you have to unmute yourself. Would yeah, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent case, Dr. Nikunj. Uh, two things. One is when there was this uh, lot of multiple cut RK, usually we target myopia in these patients. So, especially on the ASCRS online calculator, which is a combination of multiple formulae, you get the yes, average so. minimal and the maximal. So, yeah. usually you target myopia so that you don't end up having a hyperopic surprise. And okay. secondly is in when too many cuts are there, it's better to take a scleral uh, tunnel rather than a limbal so that you don't end up opening up the cuts, especially if the toric lens, if you have the incision overlying those uh, areas. And repeat the uh, biometry at least uh, three times and take check it because there could be diurnal fluctuation also in all these patients. Absolutely right. Supposing one of the incision had given way, uh, Dr. Nitin, what would you advise at that point? So you may have to suture, you may have to take a radial suture and close that incision, and then maybe you'll have to go ahead with your FACO, if at all it I, is. A, I have I, had patients like that, so I, yeah. we take a suture at NC1. Yeah. On your parameters, because uh, fluid can keep progressing from the area of the RK incision also. Yeah. So, yeah, one more thing, you need to yeah. do the, uh, check out the uh, holiday EKR report and look at the uh, peak of the graph, you know. If it is a very straight, tall peak, that means there is less keratometric variability. If it's a very flattened peak, then definitely uh, there's a poorer visual prognosis, especially if you're so using which, premium ions. Which, which, which measurement would you take? Because in this post RKI, the central optic zone could have been small. So, which would you suggest to be used? The 2 millimeter, 3 millimeter, 4.5? He has used 4.5. Would you differ? I will master reading, madam. We usually take because that gives the best result. Uh, no, ma'am. I would uh, take a topography. E EKR, I think, 4.5. Pentagam, yeah. Pentag on Pentagam, so, you can take 4.5. It's better. The closer right. you are to the center, it's better because in multiple RK cuts, you have a very small cen uh, central so optic zone. Yeah. So why 4.5? Could you use a smaller, uh, closer measurement like a 3 millimeter or something like that in these this particular case scenario? Normally, I will master and all those things. But I was wondering, I don't have the exact answer actually. It's not that I have an answer. I'm asking this particular question. I feel that Possibly an EKR value would also give a guidance and possibly going to a three millimeter optic zone because how close to the center you measure is better. And then this, there's already a lot of irregular astigmatism in these post RKIs. Of course, VVT is a very forgiving lens. So that is uh, one thing uh, uh, which is uh, favorable. And the other one point, uh, I, if anybody has an answer, you're most welcome to interrupt. The other thing is post-operatively, we do expect some amount of hyperopia in these cases. So we should have uh, at least checked twice at an interval uh, to know whether there is a refractive glass. Yes, uh, Rishi, uh, Dr. Satyamurti. Yes, Dipali, what do you want to add? I just wanted to ask that, uh, would you consider only the anterior surface keratometry value or you would include the posterior surface also, like including the total keratometry? Ideal master is the way to go. I agree. Because uh, RK incision is altering both the anterior and the cornea, posterior cornea. So a total keratometry would be the way to go. 
but in yes. many patients we have seen that the anterior curvature value which is taken from the topography and if you take the central 1 or 2 mm value that is very much flatter as compared to the total k of the iol master so, so that is why uh, i was uh, unclear in, yes sir like lasik rk the anterior posterior relationship is not that much altered so it's uh, reasonable to also go with the anterior values the flattest value we get from the topography which gives the central 1 or 2 mm value which is yeah. i think yeah even i i felt that would be no, the no, right no, answer. No, yes no, dr satyamurthy what do you want to add no no i was then a higher operation i mean what was the higher operation in this case uh, because optic zone was small and uh, any higher operations which can mar the this thing uh, post op uh, Absolutely. So that's why I mean any kind of uh, ring base I also oh, better to find out that first. Treat the cornea with laser, and maybe you can go ahead with the thing. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk, and wonderful questions came up. Uh, we'll go on to our next speaker, Dr. Saurabh uh, Saurabh uh, Parijit, who is in private practice uh, from uh, Muzaffarpur, and he's a, a, a veteran FACO surgeon. And he's going to show his video. On to you, Dr. Saurabh. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. I'm going to. Can you share your video? Yes, ma'am. I'm just sharing. First, open a visit to the video, then share, please. Probably has not opened his video earlier. I have opened, ma'am, but I have not shared on this. So, mean that I can just add one point here. There are two schools of thoughts. This four point five EKR was provided by Holiday in two thousand nine with Pentacam. They suggested that four point five is the ideal zone for measuring. EKR. Uh, recent study in 2019 from Hill Group. They suggest it's better to take one to four mm as the ideal because that is where the RK patient most of the time. That is the visual access practically. So 1.4. If you go by the current studies, that should be the area EKR should be taken. In fact, they take the atlas rings, the one, two, three, four rings in the ASL yes. line calculator. You have a place where you can put in all those, so you get. More data you put in, the more accuracy you can get. I think uh, sort of, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, ma'am, this is the not the video. Just oh, then, then you yeah, are just not open, the, Dr. Parija, just open your uh, video first, pause it, and then share. Uh, yeah. How can I share my desktop? It's on the desktop. Oh, you, okay. Just open your presentation Mr. first. Mr. Sunil, Pause it. Mr. Sunil, uh, yes. let me take the next surgeon. You okay. call him on phone and guide him. Yes, he sir. has yes. not opened his presentation. So we next go on to Dr. Prafula Kumar Maharana, who is a young consultant from uh, RP Center uh, of uh, uh, Center of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And he has a very interesting uh, presentation to show. Good evening, everyone. If my PPT is visible. Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. So I'll be showing you a case of interlenticular lens aspiration. Being a referral center, getting such cases is uh, quite common in our emergency services. So this is the surgical technique that we follow here. It's uh, interlenticular lens aspiration. The proper term would have been intracapsular lens aspiration. So this was a case of 12-year-old uh, boy with enter dislocated lens for a long time. As you can see, the iris atrophy, corneal scar, and the entry capsule almost stuck to the cornea. So what we do is make two side port entry from uh, 10 and 12 o'clock position, extend that MBR further to create two capsulotomy at the equator, stay in these areas where you have entered the lens because if subsequently you have to come out and go again, then you may miss the original uh, capsulotomy that you have done. You can 
do limited hydro delineation as you can see by the golden ring that is there do it multiple times so that the surgery becomes much faster in contrast to previously described techniques where they use vitrector we prefer a bimanual irrigation aspiration because with vitrector the problem is if you accidentally catch the capsule the capsule may torn and lens matter may drop into vitreous cavity so using a bimanual gives you that safety margin even if you catch it uh, then it's unlikely that you will create a tear once the lens aspiration everything is complete then you can uh, see whether the capsule is adhered to the posterior surface of the lens if it is not adhered then you can take a bimanual cutter and first try to remove the anterior capsule and then the posterior capsule to create minimal disturbance to the vitreous cavity vitreous interface and if you are in doubt you can use always always use tricot so that complete vitrectomy is achieved and you can see the patient had ectrop and uv and all sorts of problem because it was a very long standing case and after complete vitrectomy it's always good practice to achieve a watertight closure mm -hmm. using sutures mm -hmm. and so this is uh, what is the basic technique is and if you have advanced tool like uh, microscope integrated oct which my next video i'll be showing you that will be quite helpful but it's not a mandatory for such procedure you can have that that gives you an extra precaution or extra real time monitoring of your cases as you can see in this case it was a entry dislocated lens the patient was 19 year old and it was almost stuck to the cornea you can see there were firm adhesion plaques between the capsule and the cornea posterior surface cornea so i would uh, so you'll be more careful when pulling out the lens capsule so for surgical procedure is same two capsulotomy is extending the mbr further to create uh, capsulotomy at the equator equator is the strongest part of the lens so that uh, doesn't extend that tear doesn't extend and as, as you could see i tried to release it with the visco but that was not possible so lens aspiration was completed similar to the previous case and then you can peel the capsule using microvitreoretinal forceps as you can see in the right side clearly shows an indent when you are trying to pull in the capsule but yes it can be released with gentle maneuvering but ioct gives an idea of where exactly you are once it is done it's a good practice to do pi in all these cases and this complete the uh, surgery by putting suture we published this technique in a series of 11 patients in journal i then in ijo as a surgical technique but the main point is uh, what it advise about the main points are that always stay in the capsulotomy that you have created in lens because the cornea are edematous and if your microscope is not that good quality then you will miss your previous points and bimanual is preferred over cutter these are few example of post op cases and why intraretinal lens aspiration because it allows you for con controlled removal of your lens matter and it prevents any drop of lens matter into post op posterior vitreous cavity and it's quite safe you can and anybody can do this technique in any setup if you have a bimanual with you thank you very much and yes. uh, thank you chaitra ma'am for this opportunity and all the best for your future endeavors thanks a lot raful and that was a wonderful uh, case which you showed so i'm going to ask dr arup and of course raful you can add your thoughts now if a case is a case of a microsphere of fifia can you stop sharing if if uh, dr arup uh, are you there yeah if it is a case of a microsphericia and it is not uh, dislocated into the anterior chamber what would be the primary thing you would advise in these eyes dr arup uh, i did uh, a lot of case of uh, anti, anti uh, lensectomy followed by scleral but uh, now uh, few cases i i keep the capsule and uh, capture the optic and haptic is haptic is uh, fixed with the with the sclera and i have showed uh, you video quite a time this is a reverse technique of blue dial uh, where where basically uh, basically we fix the fix the capsular bag and put the eyeball in the into the bag in the 2c on the ring here i actually fix the eyeball and capture the optic that's a these are the case i am uh, you know, i did seven eight cases like this and all this doing good enough but uh, most of the cases surgeon prefer to do lensectomy followed by blue dial intraoral fixation 
So, Dr. Praful, I think uh, uh, this was a case of lens in the anterior yeah. chamber. In your setup, when would you all do decide to do a PI? If the surgery is going to be delayed, the patient is seeing uh, apparently well, and it has not yet become a wandering lens, but you see it's a micro sclerobachia. Would you do a YAG PI right away? Yes, routinely we do that. If you are uh, dealing with the case of microsphericia, yeah, but the lens is not that mobile and the lens yeah. is clear, it's always a bit good practice to do a PA. Yeah. And in fact, few surgeons, they, uh, they uh, put the patient on pilocarpin for a, almost a long time. But we don't use that. But yes, pilocarpin is also a good, useful tool in such patients. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Praful, there was no correction of... Uh... The no, it was done in, in emergencies. Second, so second sitting, it was done. We didn't have the chance to. Oh. All cases had undergone SFR subsubsequently. Okay. Yes. Just right. had one query. You yes. could have just put in a sheet slide and then done a fake aspiration. Everything would have come out with easily without any risk of material going inside anywhere in the posterior chamber. So that would. Probably uh, same. But seat this. glide, seat glides. You need a four mm incision. So, but with this technique, you can simply get away with two MBR ports. That was it the did. advantage. Mm. Was the pupil dilated during the surgery, or you didn't dilate? No, no, it was fixed because uh, that dislocation was there for a long time. Yeah. And uh, at times, uh, you are surprised the primary ophthalmologist they didn't. They couldn't diagnose this was interdislocation lens. The case was referred simply by a diagnosis of corneal opacity. So oh, even they missed yeah. that. Okay. 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 Thank you very much for a very different video and uh, learning which came with it. We go on to our next presenter, Dr. Prasanna Ramesh, who's a young uh, Lokma cataract surgeon from uh, Mahatma Eye Hospital, Private Limited from Pichu. And... Um, very innovative in his uh, approach to whatever he sees. And uh, he is going to show us his particular case. On to you, Dr. Yes, uh, ma'am, I'm audible, ma'am. Uh, audible, yeah, audible. Yes, ma um, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chitra, ma'am, and the whole ARC team. Uh, for the next few minutes, uh, I'll show a case on a watchful redemption from a domino effect of a complication. So it's one of the complications, so I thought I'll keep it simple and very basic. Uh, one of my complications in a combined surgery case. So we all do mistakes, so I thought I'll take this opportunity to show one mistake which happened and it set into a serial series of mistakes which caused a very grave complication in a case of mine. So this is a patient 624 vision, primary open angle glaucoma with immature senile cataract. Patient was on one anti-glaucoma medication and the IOP was well under control and a combined surgery was advised, trabeculectomy with cataract extraction. So things were all going as per plan. As you can see, uh, this is a traction suture followed by uh, a fornix based conjunctival flap and then uh, a beautifully well-taken uh, trabeculectomy flap. And things were all going as per plan up till this, this moment. So this is one of the techniques that I learned from my mentor, uh, Dr. Satyam Sir, a uniplanar uh, flap dissection. And then another site, I went to start the cataract extraction. So the instrumentation was slightly blunt and you can see here more to my liking, the entry was slightly more anterior. Just going back again, the corneal incision was slightly more anterior apart to my liking because the instrument was slightly blunt and I had to wriggle slightly more. So that was the first mistake that happened. And then uh, the rexus was completed and then the hydro dissection was done and uh, I did try rotation, but then it was not rotating. So ideally speaking, I should have completed the rotation and then went for the trench. I thought, okay, let me get the trench first and then maybe rotate it. So that was the second mistake I was making and uh, we'll be seeing what happened in the further events. So once I made the trench and it was not rotating, I thought, okay, let me just now try the hydro so that we can go ahead. And now we can see that now the iris starts getting floppy. And uh, to add on the corneal edema because of the anterior entry of the keratome, the corneal edema also started to set place. So I had a corneal edema in the wound, uh, IFIS, and all due to uh, mistakes which could have been avoided. Now the rotation started taking place, and I thought I can get away with a smaller, as the pupil also was going to get smaller, I thought if I can make a crack and get away with it, I can start doing it. I was able to make a crack, and the surgery was going, and just one more fragment was there, the ME nucleus. Okay, one more, and what I was thinking was, okay, I can get away with it. 
but uh, that was when uh, the complication happened. So the pupil was getting smaller, the visibility was getting uh, very, very weaker. So these are things that I don't, uh, uh, don't want to repeat again. This was one of the cases in 2021, as you can see on the left, where uh, it was one of the learning cases where I learned a lot of points that should not be done. So then the rent happened. So because of the visibility issues, you can see the rent here and I was in a very tricky spot here. So this was on my plate to manage because of the many cognitive distortions that I was undertaking, which could have easily made this a much better procedure, but this was on my plate to manage now. So the redemption, because I was in a position where there could not be a single mistake from this point onwards, because the patient was already a glaucoma patient. So uh, I had to go for uh, uh, the side ports on the other aspect, the nasal side, and then the hooks was put, which I had to, which I should have put a long time back. But then I stained with tricot. I diluted it one third because it was tri uh, the pre uh, I didn't want the patient to steroid respond, and I diluted it, and then started doing vitrectomy despite the fragments. I didn't want to disturb any of the fragments with the phaco probe. Did a thorough vitrectomy and uh, cleared as much vitreous as possible. Then with gentle parameters, the remaining uh, epinuclear fragments and the remaining quadrants were all taken. And then you can see before removing the phaco probe with the left hand instrument, uh, high molecular weight viscoelastic was added and meticulous cortex aspiration was done. And now I was able to assess the patient. I was starting to breathe better. And then uh, the rent was very well secured. And with a high molecular weight viscoelastic, I was able to tuck the leading aptic into the bag. And as you can see here, the leading aptic went into the bag and slowly but gently, all the maneuvers were carefully done and the IOL was carried out being placed in the bag itself, in this case, as you can see. So once the IOL was placed again, owing to, uh, I can see now the trialing aptic is now passed into the bag. So once the centration was very well appreciated, I felt the anterior rim was more contracted to my liking, rather the capsular excess was slightly smaller. So I wanted to make sure that there should not be any capsular phimosis uh, owing to the nature of this patient, even in the future, a gentle uh, meticulous uh, with the microcapsular excess uh, scissors and then the forceps, a simple uh, completion of the anterior capsular rim was then uh, taken. And then you can see uh, the hooks were removed. So once the hooks were removed, a small uh, fragment was hiding, uh, but that was a little easier to manage. A small phaco fragment was hiding in, uh, below the corneal, fragment, corneal edema, and then that was also removed. So again, with all slow meticulous parameters, that was removed, and I went to the completion of my trabeculectomy uh, surgery, where again the incision was made, uh, entry was made into the anterior chamber, followed by a punch with Kelly's punch, and then the PA, and then closing the uh, trabeculectomy uh, wound. And then I, I used a Ologen, it was 2021, two years back when Ologen was available. So this was one of the learning cases of mine, a single mistake, which I'm not proud of, which I'm not going to repeat, but I felt this thought many things that made me a better person. So this is an 18 month review of the same patient uh, done 18 months back and the blib is doing on well. It's Ologen blib, uh, which is slightly oxidized and the blib is still doing on well. And this is the current state of the patient. The right A is six, six parts and he's on no anti-glaucoma medication. IOP is 10 millimeters. And this is the uh, anterior image. As you can see here, this is the Dyson species that is seen in the superior part. And you can see the rim, the posterior capsular rim, mostly could have been a punch hole because of the corneal edema, which led to the lack of visibility. So one step that you thought I could manage or I could lead on to the another one was the main culprit here. And I thought uh, that was one of the basic mistakes I did two years back. And uh, this is a before surgery and after surgery fundus picture. And I made a mistake. There are only three things that could be done. Uh, I just need to acknowledge it, admit it, learn from it, and not repeat it. I felt this case taught me a lot, and I felt uh, sharing this in this podium uh, to all the elite panel would be uh, very useful. Now, thank you once again, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity for making me present this case. Thank you. Yes, yes, Prasanna, you said said it all. He gave us the explanation for a stromal hydration and a, a anterior paste incision and the hydro not being effective and he did overzealous hydro and that pushed the iris uh, forward. So it was not a floppy iris because of the fluid in the anterior chamber and viscoelastic iris came forward. Maybe you should have used the iris hook at that point itself. And, uh, and I'm sure if you, uh, if that itself would have taken care or you felt there was a little positive pressure, you could have even given anitol in that particular case 
to make it a very decongest the vitreous and bond further. But Iris, who earlier on would have helped, sure. just for a sake of uh, uh, questioning, um, like uh, it was a well managed uh, PCR. But uh, how the expert in the uh, panel, if you've had a PCR in a case of a trap, would you like to go ahead and complete the trabeclectomy and uh, uh, finish the case? Or would any of you want to postpone the trabeclectomy part of it? Dr. Satimurti? Unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. No, I'll go ahead with the uh, trabeclectomy and complete the thing. Why necessarily wait and why, the, why let the pressure increase? Yes. Yeah. It'll have to be problems. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I in this patient, uh, excellent video, Dr. Prasanna. You could have also used uh, phenocaine plus. I mean, because mm -hmm. it is it was coming down. That means it was not a case of small people to start with. So um, if you just stop. Basically due to my cognitive distortion. Exactly, exactly. So... Yeah, with phenocaine plus, it could have dilated a little more. And if it didn't, then definitely Iris Hooks would have been. Uh... Yes, ma'am. Two years back, this happened, ma'am. Hopefully, all went well. And this was one of the. Very well managed. Thank you. Yeah. One of my learning cases. And. Yes. Who is talking? No, but Hello. To show this, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Anybody else uh, has any comment from the expert panel? Shall we move on to our next case? Because he's Prasanna, discussed all the problems which I came. I think I should just appreciate Dr. Prasanna for his honesty and uh, the way he has shared a uh, complication. Not everybody is brave enough to do that. And very beautiful message. You have, uh, very nice way of the complication. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We we'll go on to our next presenter, Dr. Praveen Subudhi, who's a young consultant from uh, Ruby Eye Hospital, Bhuvaneshwar, and I had a, a personal experience of being there in Bhuvaneshwar last week for an ARC meeting, and I was so touched with the warmth and the welcome which I received in that place. And uh, uh, so let's uh, watch uh, Praveen's case. Vortex suture is available in Bombay. She wants to spell I was telling you no, that I will, I will, I will cross check about that no, and no, get back to you. Move. Nitin, oh, sir, I will cross check and I will get back to you on that, sir. I think Satyamurti, sir, also might be knowing about that. Uh, Srinivas, you all have to mute yourself when you all are talking. Yeah, yeah. Can I go ahead? Yes, yes. Yes, Praveen. So at the outset, I would like to thank uh, ARC and Chitra Madam for giving me this opportunity. And I'm feeling very flattered and uh, appreciating in the august presence of all the great surgeons. This surgery is mostly a simple surgery, but using some traditional instruments, probably we can have a food for thought at the end of the presentation. So this one, so I'll just... So this patient did not reveal any history of trauma initially, but as I started my rexis, I could uh, visualize the folds in the anterior lens capsule, which showed that there was some form of jonular dehiscence. And whenever you feel there is a jonular dehiscence, you need to be a little bit careful while doing uh, hydrodissection. You need not be over jealous because if you do over hydrodissection, you may increase the jonular weaknesses. And managing the nucleus is also critical here. In this case, you need to have a first free rotation of the nucleus. And while cracking the nucleus, I prefer using uh, doing a horizontal chop because I feel uh, doing a horizontal chop reduces the um, stress on the jonules. And you need to be, uh, your parameters needs to be a little bit uh, low and you need to be very slow in your approach. And while I remove, I was removing the last part, I could visualize the AC was shallowing. That means the fluid has gone into the vitreous and uh, the bag was uh, raising. So 
instead of uh, going ahead with the FICO, I just uh, extended a little bit the incision and removed with the help of forceps. And I prefer using Simco cannula because I like uh, in these cases. And so you can see here the zonal is already been uh, gone in the sub incisional area. So it's better. To start uh, removing the cortex from the attached journals and then just peel it uh, go circumferentially. Then you can remove the cortex. You can see that there's a uh, vitreous coming out from the journal. Before my sister gave me the automated vitreous, I thought of using uh, the manual uh, with the help of one us. So I could remove the vitreous. And as soon as I removed the vitreous and put viscoelastic, the bag started unfolding. At this point, I thought of implanting a CTR so that I could stabilize the bag. And rotate the CTR so and place a single piece intraocular lens. You can see the cortex is there. So I have to lift the uh, lens and uh, remove the cortex. It's better to put sutures, as many sutures as possible because it's uh, always better because uh, it's a large wound and uh, there is a risk of uh, wound uh, infection entering into the wound. At the end, I usually always put a tricot to see whether any residual vitreous is there. So this is the presentation, and I think it opens the Pandora's box of uh, discussion. Yeah. No, no, nice uh, case, Praveen. But yes, I would have preferred to have used the CTR much earlier on in this case, or if not a CTR, I would have used capsular hooks to stabilize the bag and at a point of time use a CTR because the sub-incisional dialysis, you keep going in and out to the FACO probe. You could hydrate that area of uh, vitreous and then uh, the area of dialysis could actually increase. So I would have uh, preferably placed a CTR and a, or a, a capsule hook at that point of time. And the other important thing is that the open end of the CTR should not come to rest in that area of zonular dialysis. The, the eyelet should be well away from the area of dialysis. I wasn't very sure about how that was placed. But uh, otherwise, and of course, a manual cutting or using a vexel sponge, all of that uh, can cause some traction in the vitreous base. So it is best to use a, a proper anterior vitrectomy in these uh, cases right from the very beginning. And uh, we have, I have also uh, used uh, Vana scissors to cut many, many years back, but now I would not uh, do that at all. Um, Dr. Nitin, you want to add anything? Dr. Rishi, you want to add anything? I agree with uh, Chitra that probably even with the cataract inside, when you just started the rexis, after you could feel that the rexis was uh, going very, uh, you know, like it was difficult to pull it because of the weak, weakness. So probably you could have even put a CTR with the cataract inside. So that was one option that could have stabilized the bag very well. And uh, you could have done the FACO after that. Yeah. Uh, I would have used Triamcinolone yeah. to check for any residual vitreous because it was not uh, uh, yes. was manually. He did use it. Oh, he, he did. Used it. I missed it. Dr. Gopal Raju, anything to add? Yeah, yeah. when you suspect a granular weakness at the ASIM, and when you are doing an hydro dissection or hydro delineation, it's always better to start in the area zone of the hydro dissection and uh, in the weakness, uh, zonular weakness zone. So that when the fluid is coming on the other side and then lifting the nucleus, so it won't put much uh, stress on the uh, zonules and they will further extend it. There's another care uh, I think we should take. And this in this case, the lesson is uh, the timing of, like you are rightly said, the timing of the it should be open. Okay. The timing of keeping the CTR should be open, and you should not hesitate to put it even after the capsular exercise. Yes. Yeah. 
a good teaching video, Praveen. We and uh, we had missed out. I mean, I'm very very sorry. I kept forgetting, and we missed out. Doctor Saurav is was by has been back and has been messaging me that I should invite him in. So we will go on to watch your case, Doctor Saurav. Yeah, you can unmute yourself, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra, ma'am. Ma'am, ma my video is uh, visible now? Yes, yes. Uh, ma'am, I'm showing <clears throat> PECO emulsification in a Morganian cataract where there is a risk of capsular runaway. Mm -hmm. So this is a case of uh, Morganian cataract, it's totally white uh, and uh, first making a side port. Uh, I have, I have uh, already put superior rectus suture in case I, I have to convert if the rectus runs away or any other complication, uh, if I have to convert into SICS. Tripan blue staining has been done. <clears throat> Keeping the tri tripan blue for some time so that staining is good. And now using uh, high density viscoelastic as well as methyl cellulose. Uh, now uh, we'll go for another side port for the chopper. And now we'll, uh, I'll go for the main port. First marking the, this is the temporal incision. Mar marking the incision site and <clears throat> then entering. This is a 2.8 uh, incision keratome. The challenge in this case is that uh, because of uh, too much of milky fluid, there is a high intralenticular pressure and that might lead to a runaway of the rexis. So after making an initial puncture, I'm making a small opening using a <clears throat> rexis forceps. And uh, I'm not very comfortable because of the uh, fluid which is leaking. So aim is to make a small mini rexis. And after that, <clears throat> the fluid can be washed using a Simco cannula. And now you can see the uh, nucleus to, uh, totally mobile. And I'm using a, a Varnas scissor. Uh, previously, this is an old video. At that time, I didn't use a micro uh, scissor for uh, making mix and uh, so now the size of the rexis is being enlarged. Now the bigger rexis is being made. And here also I, uh, the rexis didn't uh, compete further. So I'm making another nick. So this nick has gone little bit towards the equator. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very apprehensive that uh, maybe I'm not, I won't be able to complete the rexis, but uh, using uh, the forceps, rexis forceps. I try to retrieve the rexis towards the center. Now the aim is to pull the rexis towards the center, towards the uh, center and complete the rexis totally. So slowly, slowly, this, you don't have to be in a hurry. You have to complete the rexis very slowly. And at each step, you have to make sure that the rexis doesn't run away. But somehow or the other, <clears throat> because the mu nucleus is also very mobile and uh, you have to patiently complete the rexis. This I have been able to do. And now <clears throat> using a direct chop method, I'm dividing the nucleus. 
since the nucleus is very mobile so you have problem in uh, going ahead with the the cracks another another chop is being made slowly i am able to <clears throat> crack the nucleus in multiple pieces but the center is still attached very patiently we have to go now this this is a horizontal chop so i am combining both uh, vertical as well as horizontal chop method and now i am able to emulsify the pieces quadrant removal is being done and uh, this is the last piece another fragment is there so that will also come and uh, this uh, hydrophilic lens has been placed in the bag dialed and i've centered the nucleus i centered the uh, iul and this is the end of the surgery yeah lots of uh, learning tips which came through about making a, a right size rexes and a small one and then enlarging it and the challenges in phaco emulsification and a well done surgery uh, thank you very much dr saurabh uh, uh, anybody wants to uh, comment dr gopal raju would you want to comment or uh, dr yeah, yeah i uh, think as such the nucleus is very small uh, we don't have to make an attempt to make it into multiple pieces maybe we can attempt one crack and then sometimes even if you start emulsifying it from one edge you can easily bring it out because uh, as such there is hardly any support in the bag so when you are trying to crack there is always a risk that uh, the pc will be damaged yeah but it so, has uh, successfully completed it cracking and so, all so this uh, morganian cataract was already discussed earlier the other options are yeah. whether you use a my loop or a scaffold or a ctr and these are all the possibilities i'm not repeating it but a well done surgery uh we go on to dr ashu who was not available earlier on uh, sorry dr santosh uh, your video would come after that the dr just ashu one, agrawal i uh, just one suggestion that when you are uh, you could have used uh, now the 23 gauge uh, scissors and the forceps yeah. which would yeah. help you to uh, extend the rexus very well and the other yeah. thing is if your rexus is eccentric then it is always better you can go and cut on the other side where the uh, capsule is more compared to the one where it is very less so the extension or tearing of that rexus will not happen yes yes so uh, we go on to our next speaker dr ashu agarwal who heads the perfect site center in east of kailash delhi and he is going to show his complex case on to you dr ashu thank you ma'am thank you for this opportunity and uh, good evening friends so uh, i'll be talking about capsule hooks and segments in the management of subluxated cataracts this i feel is still a challenge for the most experienced surgeons this is a case where the rexus was where the dialysis was observed after the nucleus management had been done so i'm using a rail roading technique here after a scleral and i use a scleral tunnel because it helps seal the uh, wound and also the knot is buried automatically a rail road technique is used here the second needle is being passed this is a 26 gauge needle and a double arm proline suture which has been passed through the eyelet of the capsule hooks these are indigenous hooks manufactured in india this was the very first case that i had done and the hook is put in if you can notice here this is the rexus and the size of the arc the arc length of the hook is much more than the uh, rexus so there was uh, there is initially a learning curve here when you try to negotiate it inside fortunately now the 
is a, for those who find it difficult and are starting out, there's modification uh, by Canabrava. It's called, they're called the Canabrava hooks and the arc length has been shortened. Although I personally prefer these because once inside, they put give greater support to the uh, phonical support to the capsule, the zonular dialysis here. So just a slight tug and we tighten it. We should not pull it too much. Otherwise, there'll be tenting of the uh, rexus edge and the knot gets buried. So this I feel, uh, because uh, when you're doing a surgery, both internal and external support are required. For external support, I use prefer to use capsule hooks now. Earlier, of course, it, like everyone else, it was these were iris hooks. But now we have capsule hooks available. This is post uh, day one picture. And you can see this little tenting over here. There's another case where the, there was a dialysis to begin with, zonal dialysis, a significant one. And I plan to use capsule hooks for the initial support as the external support, followed by either Sioni's ring or capsule segments, depending on how the case proceeded. So here, uh, the usual FACO emulsification is done. Uh, some colleagues have already shown some good videos there. And irrigation aspiration is being done. Some few pointers here that uh, we should uh, keep the, as uh, someone has mentioned, uh, Rex is centered on the dialysis. And a gentle FACO emulsification should be done. We should not be very aggressive in our FACO settings. And these uh, hooks are placed through relatively vertical incisions. After the surgery is over, we I remove the hooks because the, and the capsule hook is being implanted, inserted inside. Initially, they can be a little tricky because this eyelet arm is at a different uh, plane, but soon you get the hang of it. Again, it's gently tightened without too much of a tug. And the lens is being implanted. So if the zonular dialysis, if there's just zonular laxity, you can uh, put in hooks at intervals of 90 degrees. But if it's uh, zonular dialysis, frank dialysis, I would suggest 45 degrees and the incisions are a little vertical, less beveled that is. And the uh, incisions through which the hooks go in should also be hydrated always. This is post-op day one picture. Thank you for a patient hearing. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Shagarwal. That was very elegantly shown cases. Um, would you believe in tying your suture knot after placing the IOL or for better centration or would you tie it beforehand itself? Uh, Ma'am, uh, I tie it beforehand. It gives me a sense of security because then there's a little uh, support there because that's the whole idea of the surgery of putting in segments or Sioni's ring is that there's support to the zonular thing. And when we are the I while tying the knot to center it, you know, I don't, if you pull it too much, it gets, there's a tug there you can see. But even if it gets pulled up, there's not loss of, loss of centration unless there's a almost 180 degree or close to 180 degree dialysis because otherwise the rest of the zonules are keeping everything, the bag in place. Yeah. But yes, that is a thought. One can tie it a little later, but provided that the zonal dialysis is not too much, not more than three or four clock hours. And, uh, can I ask you, a question? Yes, 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 Rishi. Dr. Yes. Ashu, have you tried the Canabrava segment? I've used them. They are, a bit, they are not so easy to use. They keep turning out. They don't stay in place as well as these uh, CT segments. So I'm not very happy with I, them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that is, uh, so I tried it once, but the thing is, you know, that is the whole, there is this advantage, and especially if you're trying out, out the, this, the first video you saw was the very first of the hooks implanted in the country of these indigenous ones ma manufactured by Madhu Instruments. And the same manufacturer brought the Canabrava. The advantage is that it goes in easily, but you're right, it keeps flipping around because the whole, the when there's an arc length, when there's an arc, that, that itself holds it in place. So you're very right. I personally don't prefer that as I mentioned in my video also when I was in my presentation. But that's a because, you know, to get that initial advantage so that you're able to negotiate it inside the rex, uh, capsule excess, you lose a lot of advantage because they're not very stable. They keep flipping around because the arc, the arc is lost. It's almost like a straight segment, slightly curved. Would you believe in using two segments if the case demanded or would you 
take your call to a glued iron. Ma'am, uh, not so, this particular dialysis. More advanced dialysis. Uh, Ma'am, I think of, uh, uh, yeah, I would rather use. I'm very comfortable with segments and sionies also, and two segments is a very very good option. I think because you see the advantage of having the length in the bag. far offsets the advantage of a glued oil which is a great procedure but you know i'd rather have the bag in place the lens i'm sorry i'm sorry the lens in place where it naturally should be rather than doing a glued oil so i would go for two segments and because uh, see, the problem is that the reason the segments i think came in is because cioni is a very as anyone who's used cioni knows it's a very flimsy thing there are two strands coming in so those three flimsy things they are very confusing for even the most experienced surgeon and i have practically stopped doing sionies now i mean i don't think i've done for any for the last 5 years and segments is my go to device and i am i think two segments is also a very good option yes we shall now go on to our next can we can we put uh, ctr in addition to that yes to so that's a very good question dr gobal raju so the advantage that sionies gives is that it gives you uh, along with the support it gives you circular expansion of the capsular bag so which is not there with the segment but if you combine the segment with a ctr you get the same benefit as a cioni because you get the circular expansion of the bag the uh, support in its entirety and the uh, segment offering the support in the localized area yes thank so you i think that's a, i i do that also i do that often that's a very good option actually i'm going to move on there is lot to discuss but uh, there are still four speakers thank you, here we go on to dr santosh agarwal who is a senior mm -hmm. consultant at sushit netralia Uh, Aurangabad, and he is going to talk his case. On to you, Doctor Santosh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. I am sharing my video, which is a again PCR with nucleus species drop. Uh, I preferred combined surgery that is in one go. That is PECO with uh, vitreous surgery in one go. No two-step surgery. So I will show my surgery. This is the PC rent with nuclear pieces. This is the phaco emulsification in a relatively small pupil. I put the Gupta's ring to expand the pupil to the desired size to make the phaco with ease. Now I perform the phaco in a usual manner. but suddenly you see now this is the pc rent which happened then i went ahead with directly three port vitrectomy as i am a vitreoretinal surgeon so i could do that and uh, my previous experience told me that uh, doing two step surgery closing the surgery will would cause a uh, lot of inflammation after 3 4 days and uh, iop rise also and it is very difficult to convince the patient for second surgery so i decided to go for this vitreous surgery i did complete vitrectomy i explained the patient on the table only that some pieces has gone behind and i am going to remove it it will take another 10 minutes only so he was relaxed he allowed me to do all those things i injected uh, subtinon uh, uh, zalocan now this is the large piece which i could remove through pupil that is the most uh, advantageous part if i uh, would have done iol and then uh, in second step i have uh, i have to go for uh, this uh, phragmaton but it is not needed at all large pieces can be removed through the pupil i perform complete vitrectomy with pvd induction carefully because is the attached retina i don't want to create any added problem then i came forward and uh, did the uh, all the messy things and the cortex and remaining vitreous i removed from the inter segment also i watch for the periphery i removed as much vitreous i could remove from the periphery i also look for any break or any hole that had been caused during vitrectomy and i put the lens as there was no three piece lens available 
I have put the one piece lens in the sulcus. That is not a preferable option. So when there is any problem or challenge you face during surgery, one should be very cautious and go for this. I, I, I dilated the pupil with this uh, ring. That was most uh, important point. And second thing, to avoid post-op inflammation and uh, IOP rise. I went ahead with the FACO with uh, vitreous surgery in one go. And the uh, very second day or third day, I could see 6-9 six, 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 vision and uh, very quiet eye post-operatively. So my message is, if you under, uh, uh, if you come across this type of uh, PC rent and nucleus drop or nucleus pieces drop, it is better to go with the combined surgery or in one go. But only thing is that you should be vitreoretinal surgeon or some in-house vitreoretinal surgeon should be there. Otherwise, you can't do all those things. Thank you very much for your patient listening, ma'am. Thank you very much, Dr. Santosh. You showed us both the anterior segment and the posterior segment drama at one stage. Uh, the only thing was you had a small rexis. And the important thing here is uh, small rexis phaco becomes even more challenging than a small pupil phaco. So that was one challenge. And of course, you already mentioned you should not place a single piece in the sulcus at all. And uh, that could have been easily avoided. You're such a good surgeon. You could have uh, not placed that. Uh, you could have placed a th three piece in the sulcus and done an optic capture because your excess was nice and small. So otherwise, it was a wonderful surgery. I don't think uh, Dr. Satyamurti want to say something. Shall we go on to the next uh, presenter? We can go on to the next thing, ma'am, because yeah. it has covered most of the things. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. covered everything in his talk. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Santosh. Thank uh, you, ma'am. Go on to our next speaker, Dr. Shruti Nishant, who's a, a, a pediatric uh, a surgeon and also uh, anterior segment surgeon. And she's going from MNI Hospital, Chennai. And uh, let us see what she has to teach us. On to you, Shruti. Yeah, good evening, madam. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about cataract surgery in certain corneal situations. Some of them have already been covered, so I'll be running through them. So it's important to do the preoperative evaluation with a good opacity measurement and classify what type of opacity is to see the location, the extent, and especially the depth of the lesion to see what the pupil size is, because if it's already a compromised cornea, your view is less. And then if you have a small pupil, you always be ready with hooks. And the shape of the pupil can give a clue as to whether there's any adherence there. Uh, and also the type of cataract helps us to decide what kind of a surgery to go for. So this is one such case where I had a leukomatous opacity and uh, I tend to start closer to the leukomatous opacity because I have better control initially. And then, uh, as you can see, I kind of extend it. And then once the, uh, uh, the rexus is done, it's a standard. I do a stop and chop FACO. So this is a standard chop, stop and chop FACO that uh, I'm performing here. Again, I look for the clear spaces. Wherever there is a clear area, we try to do the FACO and turn it towards that side. Uh, and you can tilt the eye in any way possible to get a better view. Use red reflex wherever possible, because that is if the microscope has that uh, offering, then it's uh, good to use it uh, to provide a much clearer view of the cortex. And then uh, this is another case where uh, it was a uh, it was a slightly bigger scar, but then you can see it's just a nebular. So uh, a good red reflex in itself would give a clear view of the capsule. And uh, here again, it's important to move the eye uh, whenever we do the FACO to get a better view of the places where it is hidden with the scar. And I cautiously do the FACO in the area, which is the clearer part. So I do smaller pieces, chop them up into smaller pieces and do it as per the comfort. I always do slow FACO in these cases. And then the IOL is placed. Now, I don't always depend on FACO in some cases. Here you can see this dense leukomatous opacity. You can see the pupil is a little misshaped. You can see an NS4 hard cataract. So I, I go for my best uh, support system, the SICS. Uh, a good SICS done is any day better than a, a bad FACO. So here uh, there's an adherence, which we kind of release it with a spatula. And then I rely on a good capsulorexis because uh, a good ca uh, capsulorexis will give us a large uh, opening with, through which the NS4 cataract can be pulled out. Here, uh, if we do really close NICs, then it 
comes to mimic a capsulotomy in itself. So you, you can see that with just one swirl, it can come out. And then the nucleus is removed and then the cortex can be aspirated. Again, I move the eyeball away from me so that I get a much clearer view and the IOL is placed in the uh, bag. So that's the procedure. This is, I think this was already discussed. This was a post-RK patient. And uh, as discussed, I have started with a scleral incision and right in between the RK scars. Now that is very important. And uh, again, it's important to do the side ports again between the scars. And uh, uh, once the entry is done, uh, the FACO has to be done under very low parameters. And uh, it's important to inject viscoelastic before uh, uh, any instrument withdrawal or removal from the anterior chamber. Again, slow FACO with low parameters and the IOL can be placed. Again, never overfill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic, otherwise there's a chance. I always tend to keep a tensero nylon ready in such cases. Now, this is the last patient. Uh, this was one with a corneal tear here. Um, I The cornea was fairly regular, so we ended up with uh, FACO surgery, uh, even with the sutures there. Uh, again, good red glow helps in assisting the surgery. The, the tip here or the, the message that I would like to say is that after the surgery is done, it's good to remove the sutures rather than before because you don't want the gaping. And then I remove the alternate sutures. And uh, uh, then maybe after some time, you can remove the others. So always plan the surgery beforehand. Use trip and blue. Use good red glow. Protect the endothelium. Uh, consider scleral incisions uh, wherever required and alter the FACO parameters uh, to suit the case. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra. It's a fairly basic topic, but I think it might What's help. So, Shati, you are actually wonderful. You had a lot of clarity in your thought. You decided to show do different different situations rather than just one particular case. And every take home point was said in this four minutes. So it was a wonderful case. So mm -hmm. the only one question is if it were a post viral scar, then uh, there could be a reactivation of keratitis. Yes. So would you would you start this patient on uh, antiviral medication? Uh, cornea person, Dr. Arup, would you be there? Or uh, Shruti would want to answer. Anybody can answer. Yeah. I usually put them on a longer course of steroids after the procedure is over and also start them preoperatively a little earlier uh, with uh, uh, in steroids. So just to prevent the reactivation. But I would like to have others' opinion. Uh, if we suspect the... Yeah. So I won't really do that. I actually, I don't take... Hello? Sorry. Hello. The Dr. precaution Nitin I would take is that I... Uh, Who's talking? Okay, Arup is talking. Ah, yes. Yes, Dr. Arup. Ah, if, we, if we think it's a viral origin, we start the oral um, antiviral uh, prophylaxis at least six weeks before uh, planning of surgery. Yes. And a uh, quick taper of, uh, of steroid. If, if it is possible, if it is some cases, a uh, quick taper of, of steroid is not possible. Then we we continue the steroid for uh, for softer steroid like lotoprednol for a longer period and our prednisolone acetate and we continue antiviral uh, anti uh, antiviral for at least six months to one year. Okay. Okay. The uh, other question okay. was in the case of the corneal tear. In a primary surgery, if the, I would believe that if there is a corneal tear, I would repair the corneal tear and not, uh, even if it's a cataract or lens, I would not touch it unless there is a, a lenticular, uh, anterior lens capsule tear also with the lens fragment in AC when I would do a combined surgery. Right. Otherwise, I would do the cataract surgery and then address it. As yeah. far as removal of uh, sutures of the uh, corneal surgery, uh, Shruti explained that she would like to remove the sutures later. Any other thoughts on that? I would agree with that. This is a standard yeah. teaching and yeah. should repair uh, the cornea, stabilize the cornea first until unless there is a capsule tear. Even you can ignore the small tear without any uh, anti uh, particles matter into the anterior. Yes. Yes. And so uh, if, it, if, it, if it is maybe a year or so down, you could probably, it doesn't matter, but up to three, four, five, six months of when, uh, year, um, post operatively, I would agree with Dr. Shruti that we should remove the sutures later rather than earlier, and you know, so that the dehiscence doesn't occur. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Shruti. 
we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Vijay uh, Sharma, who is a, a senior consultant from the Army Research and Referral Hospital. And he is going to show his series of cases. On to you, Dr. Vijay. Or rather, it's a suspense. Yeah. Uh, sorry for change in the last moment for the presentation. So I'll be discussing uh, Cornell waveframe guided uh, pupiloplasty in post keratoplasty patients. So till now, we were struggling for the cataract surgery with the smaller pupils. Now we'll struggle with the larger pupils in post uh, uh, cataract surgery patients uh, uh, in post keratoplasty scenario. So, uh, uh, in such a case, uh, post uh, keratoplasty, you know, there is a high irregular corneal astigmatism and uh, pupil size, uh, uh, if pupil is irregular and large, it generates a highly irregular corneal wavefront, which uh, 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 especially if generated around the graft post junction, it uh, when it passes through the pupil and over to the fovea, it generates a severely distorted image and results in very, very poor visual acuity in these patients. Now, let's see how the alteration in the pupil size uh, changes the corneal wavefront in such uh, type of scenario. So this is a, a shine flag imaging uh, and this is a wavefront uh, error. You can see the RMS value is 11.94, uh, higher order vibrations are 8.62 and the pupil size is 7 in this case. Now let's see uh, if we change in the pupil size, how this uh, these corneal wavefront values change. Now uh, on this side, you can see from the pupil size is 7, now we have reduced it to 6. Uh, this all you can do preoperatively on the shine plug. This you reduce it to five, four, uh, then uh, this is three, and this is two. Now in this you can see the RMS value has decreased from eleven to point five. Uh, normal is around point three, and the higher order aberrations have decreased from six to point two. So uh, uh, also you can see uh, how much is the patient likely to have a visual acuity improvement if you decrease the pupil size. So this is on one side you can see the visual chart. This is a, a uh, simulated visual acuity that patient will have with a small pupil, uh, with a say two millimeter pupil compared to seven millimeter pupil. So from seven, we have reduced the pupil size to two, and you can see the points improvement in the points uh, spread function from 0 0.02 value to 0 0.18, which is around 10 times improvement in point spread function and uh, uh, significant improvement in visual acuity. Now uh, let's see. Uh, uh, this is uh, the same patient. Now let's see the. Uh, video this patient by doing a uh, pupiloplasty in this. Now uh, you can see the lens is also, lens has got significant deposits in the visual axis. So in this case, we change the uh, uh, lens, uh, uh, exchange the lens uh, by the standard technique. Uh, just take out the lens into the anterior chamber after putting a good viscodispersive uh, uh, OVD and then uh, uh, cut the lens in uh, till the half point and then you just rotate it and remove it. And uh, once we have removed it, then in this case, we put a multi-piece uh, uh, IL in the sulcus as uh, there was some compromise in the uh, integrity of the posterior PC. So once the lens is in uh, position, then we went ahead. Uh, now pupil size initially was uh, seven millimeter and we did a single pass pore through uh, pupil blasty. So, this is the first suture being passed from one side, the uh, uh, tenzoroproline straight needle, and from the other side, you pass a 26 gauge needle. Same, so we'll just take it out. And uh, then at the first loop, you pull out uh, that is between the limbus and the iris. So once you pull this out, make a small loop here, and then pass, uh, pass the port throws, the standard technique as described. So once you have done it, uh, you just pull the opposite uh, sides. So this is one. And similarly, uh, another suture was passed because people size was reduced to around five with one suture and uh, another single pass forth through on the other side. So uh, which reduced the pupil size to around 2.5 millimeter in this case. I'll just fast forward it. So this is the other side. Also, you can keep uh, small uh, uh, openings on the side, which work as a good peripheral area Yeah. So, uh, this is the post operative shine flag imaging in this patient. 2.5 millimeter pupil size, RMS value has decreased to 0.75 and higher orders to 0.25. Uh, and you can see the simulated visual acuity and a point spread function. This is the pre and post operative uh, pictures of this patient. Uh, 
you can see the significant improvement in the uh, shine flag imaging simulated visual acuity preoperatively and postoperatively with a uh, small pupil. So you have uh, uh, catered for the irregular corneal astigmatism by altering the pupil size in this patient. This is another patient. This is my second case. Uh, here the pupil size is around five. Again, a post keratoplasty patient. Although RMS value and higher orders are not very high, but uh, uh, when we did uh, uh, simulation, then we found that it will improve the visual acuity by, by around three to four lines in this patient. Uh, and we went ahead with the uh, uh, first the release of iris iridoconal additions, and then uh, did a single pass four through uh, from the one side, and uh, so with the standard technique. So this is after completion of the procedure and uh, you can see the preoperative and the postoperative wavefront analysis in this patient. The visual acuity improved from uh, 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 660 to 612 in this patient after doing the uh, single pass so I didn't. Uh, with this, I conclude. Uh, uh, the advantage of this is you can have a preoperative assessment that how much patient's visual acuity is likely to improve after doing a uh, pupiloplasty after changing the pupil size say from 7 millimeter to 2 millimeter how much is the likelihood you can explain to patient and also you can get yourself a good amount of conviction that uh, this procedure is going to improve uh, the visual acuity in the patient thank you very much yes yes, yes dr vijay that was a, a wonderful uh, uh, surgical thing and a lot of learning which is there only thing how much this pupil can dilate for a retinal examination but then on a day to day basis the kind of vision you are able to give them is what uh, has to be, uh, must be, have been a very gratifying experience for you. Yes, ma'am, it has been. And especially if you are putting only one suture, then dilatation is not an issue. You can have a good amount of dilatation. The rest of the people dilates beautifully. It may not dilate in a circular fashion, but it dilates sufficient enough to uh, give a good amount of retinal examination. If you have got two sutures on opposite side, then you have got an oval uh, dilatation, but again, sufficient for a uh, good amount of retinal examination. Um, may I say something, ma'am? Yeah, no, but there are two more surgeons who are waiting. Okay, surgeons, so we we'll so just wanted to compliment uh, uh, Vijay yes. on an excellent study. And the fact that uh, we, you know, we, we expect when we do a coronary transplant, we expect the patient to be grateful for whatever vision they get. But, uh, you know, going a step ahead and documenting it and yeah, and only thing is, can, just, can we just leave it at four millimeters? So, which uh, is a good balance between what Dr. Chitra was saying that the adequate dilation for future retinal examination, not just examination, any procedure, laser or something is there. And I think four millimeters should also be a good pupil size, three to four millimeters. And we don't need to go to two to 0.5, which isn't it? Yes, yes, true, sir. Uh, uh, depends upon amount of visual acuity that you are anticipating in improvement and vis-a-vis uh, -vis any retinal issues or other issues. Yeah. In case there are some retinal problems, you can keep it at four and also you can assess preoperatively that how much vision he is likely to improve from seven to four or six to four uh, if you change the pupil size that way. Excellent. Thank you very Excellent. much, Doctor. We go on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Tipali Singhai. Singhal is an associate consultant at Anil Eye Hospital, Dombivili, and a specialist in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery. And she's going to show her interesting case. On to you, Dipali. Thank you so much, Chit Chitra, ma'am. I'm very grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. I'm just sharing the video. So, is my screen? This is an eight-year-old child. Yeah. Yes. Yes. with post-traumatic total membranous cataract with a fibrose and calcified anterior capsule. So I planned for lens aspiration with PCIO implantation. First, main port and side ports are made, air and dye injected, proper staining is ensured since the capsule is calcified and glow is not visible. CCC was started with capsulotomy needle and micro forceps used to complete the rexis. Since the capsule was fibrosed, so I planned the rexis circle to go beyond the fibrosed area. Then gentle hydro and visco dissection done to separate and lift the peripheral hard cortex. Now a second layer of fibrous capsule was noted and lifted with forceps and peeled. Then scissors was used 
to cut and separate the dense attachments of anterior capsule with the plaque and rexis was completed. Visco is used to separate the plaque from the cortex. First, I tried with bimanual IA, but the lens matter was very hard and fibrous. So I used forceps to separate and lift the peripheral cortex from the capsular bag. Then I used phaco probe at low settings to remove the peripheral hard cortex. Then glow was visible and dense plaque was seen attached to the PC. So first I removed the peripheral cortical fibers with IF probe. Then I injected visco alongside the plaque and tried to peel it with a dialer. But the PC was getting distorted and there was a risk of PC tear. So I used micro scissors to cut the plaque along with the PC and block as a mass all round. But one part was left attached and held with forceps. And first I did anterior vitrectomy below the plaque to remove any attached vitreous before pulling the plaque to avoid any vitreous traction. Then anterior vitrectomy was done. Sulcus was formed with viscoelastic. A circular PC defect was seen with an irregular anterior capsulorexis and a three-piece IOL was placed in sulcus. With haptics rotated over the area of maximum anterior capsular rim. Mm -hmm. Pilocarpine was injected. Main port was sutured. Visco aspiration and anterior vitrectomy was completed. Air bubble was injected to make sure there is no vitreous in AC and round pupil was achieved. So take home points include always stain the capsule in a white cataract, use micro forceps and scissors for anterior capsular excess in case of a fibrosed capsule. If there is a thick central plaque then always remove the peripheral cortical matter first and keep the central plaque for the last. Then try to peel the plaque gently and use visco dissection. If densely attached to the PC then cut at the margins with scissors to create a circular PCC but keeping one unattached it is important to do anterior vitrectomy below the plaque before pulling the plaque to avoid any vitreous traction. Always keep a three-piece IOL on standby in all these type of cases. Thank you. I think that was a wonderful case uh, Dipali. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully uh, discussed also. Actually I don't even have any questions for you uh, because uh, very well done. Very good and uh, most appropriately managed. Uh, the expert panel, Dr. Satyamurti, would you want to say anything? Dr. Aru Bomik, would you want to comment? Excellent video. Yes. Thank Very you. well presented. Uh, nice to meet you, ma'am. I mean, she has told everything. So, yeah, she's you can go ahead. Yeah. Are you a power calculation in a 12 year old? Just one question. I think that's not a big challenge, right? Dipali, what would you, what did you do? Mostly in 12 year old, the axial length has already been, uh, like the eye has already grown. So the, if the axial length is more than 22 or around 22, we don't undercorrect. Up to eight years or six years, we do undercorrect by 5%. And below two years, we undercorrect by 10 to 15%. That is what we follow. Very good. Wonderful. Uh, three cheers to you. We Thank go you. on to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Piyush Pravakar Patil who's a senior consultant at Data Netralaya Yavatmal Maharashtra. And uh, I truly want to appreciate uh, Piyush uh, because, you know, uh, normally I identify my speakers uh, very much in advance, one month in advance. 
I identify them. But incidentally, he messaged me uh, uh, yesterday that uh, he, he would want to take part in a particular webinar. And I knew for this, this was my last webinar. So I, I said yes, and immediately he shared a video. And today he's there presenting it. So look forward to you watching your uh, video, Dr. Puyush. Thank you so much for the opportunity, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, is it visible? Is my video visible? Yes, visible. Yeah. I'll, I'll start. So uh, basically, this case is about a grade five six uh, cataract. It is a grade five six cataract and. Uh, uh, the, I faced uh, intraop meiosis uh, during uh, this case, and uh, I could manage it without the use of pupillary expanders. So, uh, in every uh, hard cataract case, I would like to stain the capsule. If in case the pupil goes down during the course of the surgery, uh, if you would like to place the iris hooks, then you know where the capsule is. So, in such a grade five six cataracts, I initially I make a Trough to get a good hold of the nucleus. The settings here are at uh, seventy percent uh, FACO power, and then uh, this while holding for the chopping, I use five hundred vacuum, and this is a short but sharp chopper, and this is a horizontal chop. You need to get a full separation every time. Without a full separation, you should not proceed because uh, you are going to land up in trouble later on. So as you can see, I'm separating the complete half. And now I have two heminuclei. Again, if you see my probe, it is below 50% of the uh, depth. If you don't get a good hold, then you won't be able to separate the uh, pieces fully. And these are leathery cataracts and uh, you need to go full uh, separation until you, sit the, uh, until you see the red glow. And for the paucity of the time, I have edited some parts, of course, uh, but I have uh, kept injecting uh, dispersive viscoelastics uh, almost four to five times during the uh, FACO emulsification process. Also, I have used Phenocan Plus twice during the surgery. So you can see without even uh, touching the iris, the pupil has start to, started to go down little by little. I have come out, I am using Phenocan Plus, but the pupil would not dilate. So, but with a dispersive viscoelastic uh, viscoat, it did dilate, as was uh, taught to us by Dr. Robert Osher. So, dispersive viscoelastic definitely helps. No financial interest, but I had used viscoat here, but uh, Silo code from care group is also equally good in my experience. I have, if you, uh, if you have uh, watched this, I just turned the uh, last piece. So I could attack the hard part first. For the last piece also, my vacuum is uh, 400. And you can see there was almost no surge and I could manage it very well. There's a minimum surge, no problem. Now, again, one more challenging thing in the small pupils is that the cortex, you do not see all of it. So with the, with the irrigation uh, handle, you can pull back the pupil a little to see if uh, any cortex is left behind and um, always do the IOL implantation under irrigation in small pupils so that no visco lets, uh, lets uh, behind and uh, do wash. I do wash behind the aisle every time. This was some uh, preservative for tramsilon and uh, moxifloxacin. So that is my case. Wonderful case. Uh, very well, uh, like a teaching video it was. And uh, 
the, the uh, only thing you manage to get the crack at one go, but at some times you may have to do a multi-level chopping and uh, go deep down and uh, keep separating it. It yes, may sir. not separate as you had exactly and uh, and again the important message was to do viscomediasis uh, all through what would be the uh, viscoelastic of choice for uh, this particular uh, kind of case um, initially i go uh, the sorry 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 to interrupt in the yeah. during the rexis period i first in the inject a dispersive viscoelastic and beneath it i uh, inject a visco uh, cohesive viscoelastic so that is my uh, starting and then uh, during the course of the surgery, only dispersive viscoelastics. And as you said, ma'am, to achieve a full separation, you need to uh, chop on different levels. But if you make an initial uh, groove, initial trench, uh, like I made a trough, if you may say a trough, then essentially yeah. you will get a full crack every time. Yes. Anaga, you have anything to ask before we? Call yeah, it? just um, excellent video, Dr. Piyush. You. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you're doing a lateral separation of the two halves, if there is an excessive pressure on the sides, you may cause a zonular uh, or a PC tear. So that how much amount of ex lateral separation to do is, I think, the fine balance we needs to be maintained. That's yeah, all. actually, ma'am, uh, during the um, rexis only, you can uh, gauge as to how the zonules are. And if there are no wrinkling, uh, wrinkling uh, during the rexis, then uh, the amount of separation which I uh, just showed is uh, uh, no issue, I think. Yeah. Dr. Gopal Raju, would you want to add anything? Yes, Dr. Satyamurti. No. Uh, this, regarding lateral separation, only when we make the first crack, then you do the with the, both the hands. Otherwise, you just uh, do, I mean, keep one hand steady and do the, I mean, the lateral separation with the other hand so that there is no stress on the zonules. Probably yes. today you are going to protect the zonules. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Gopal Raju, any final comment yeah, on this? I think, yeah, I think at any point of time, we should not hesitate to use the people expanders. Hmm. Uh, if the, the, as the people is coming down, that puts a lot of stress on the surgeon. So if they use the people expander, uh, then it should have been uh, much more comfortable for the surgeon. Also, I, think, um, I was pretty comfortable during that. It was not a uh, thing like I have to do some, uh, today I have to show that I am not using pupillary expansion. That's okay. nothing like that. Uh, okay. Right. With the use of viscoelastic, the people was uh, more wow. dilated. There is no additional stress on you, then it's fine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dr. Arup, would you want to have any last words? No, no, this is a very good uh, chopping uh, in this case, particularly. I hope uh, this cases is uh, hard enough, but it is not thick enough. But sometimes very thick cataract, you uh, this kind of uh, separation may sometimes damage Jonu. So you have to be very careful and balance, as uh, Dr. Anaga said, how much separation force you applied in in every cases you have to titrate. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. I I have no words to express uh, my gratitude to all of you speakers and the expert panel for being so patient and most of you all are still there and some of you like uh, uh, Deepali and Shruti and uh, others who are right in the end. So I am so, so uh, thankful for you all for the zeal and the enthusiasm with which you presented though we were all looking a little tired. Uh, but I'm so glad, you know, for every speaker, this four minutes is so important and, and that discussion of the points is so very important because so much of thought is given by each one of you. Like if I see you all on full screen, there's such a myriad of cases which we saw today and we discussed and the kind of way that my expert panel chipped in so beautifully so that every bit was discussed and the audience go back with some information from each of these webinars. I truly have to thank all of each and every one of you. I need to thank my uh, co-moderators, Anaka is always somehow there, the beginning or middle or end, and she's a, 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 a warrior who's there with me right to the end. And uh, and all my other uh, 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 ARC moderators, whatever they did. Um, and uh, and most importantly, uh, in this, uh, the last three years, my tenure with ARC and the webinars were just wonderful. There was not a single webinar when I came to the end of it, I would actually think that this was the best webinar all along. 
So it probably yeah. reflects that the kind of talent which we have in our uh, entire country, I just randomly select uh, speakers and everybody puts in their life and soul and seem to, as if they seem to understand the energy and the uh, desire in me that I have to deliver the best. And I can't deliver it alone, if not for the wonderful talent here. And uh, ARC actually taught me so much patience and maturity and learning and education. I truly, truly thank uh, my uh, each and every one of you for the most wonderful experience I got in these three years with ARC. Three cheers to all of you. And uh, I have to take at this moment to thank Sai, uh, Kripal, all of them who have uh, always helped me whenever I would call them and help me uh, send those emails to you to keep you all updated and informed and the kind of support I got from all of them. And most importantly, uh, you should see Sunil, the way he stays patiently through all these webinars. And the end of it, he would even, I would push him and tell me, tell him to ask, tell me the numbers. And he would always inform me how many people have watched it. I need to thank Entoad for being solid, strong, supportive, that every single webinar of mine was sponsored by them in the last three years. So, you know, at the end of it, I have so much to thank each and every one of you. And thank you so much. And I would like to, we, we should all thank Chitra ma'am for uh, being such a dynamic ARC chairman and bringing yes, us yes, uh, yes. webinars week after week, month after month with the same zest, zeal and enthusiasm throughout the last three years. So uh, round of applause to you ma'am. Wonderful uh, tenure ma'am. Congratulations. Congratulations. Continuously for three years. We are going to win again. <laughs> yeah, we are looking forward to all the best again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so you much. Good night. Amazing. Good night. Amazing, ma'am. Your failure was amazing. From all of us, uh, from all of you, again. Thank